The committee will come to order. Seven years ago, Republicans passed the Tax Cut and Jobs Act under President Trump, delivering relief to millions of families and small businesses and creating the best economy in our lifetime. In the first two years after passage of that tax relief, real wages grew nearly 5%, the fastest growth in 20 years. Real median household income increased by $5,000, a bigger gain than the prior eight years combined. The officially reported poverty rate dropped to its lowest level in US history, and black and Hispanic unemployment reached historic lows. I expect my colleagues will use the same, the same talking points about that bill being all about tax breaks for the wealthy. But the truth is, the Congressional Budget Office found that the 2017 tax law increased the share of taxes paid by the top 1% of households, while reducing the burden paid by lower income earners. As a result of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, Americans earning under $100,000 received an average tax cut of 16%. Facts are clearly facts. On the other hand, President Biden's so-called Inflation Reduction Act forced taxpayers to subsidize big banks and corporations. More than 90% of that bill's special interest tax subsidies for electricity go to companies with over one billion in sales. They also included $7,500 tax credits to purchase luxury EVs. More than 80% of those credits are claimed by households earning six figures. Democrats want to blame the 2017 tax cuts for adding to the debt while ignoring the 10 trillion they and President Biden spent during just the first two years of total Democrat control of Congress. Under the Republicans' tax law, revenues reached a record high of $4.9 trillion in 2022, nearly a trillion more than CBO's projections. Corporate tax revenues were 17% above projections. In fact, in the four years following enactment of the tax law, revenues averaged an increase of $205 billion per year above what was estimated. The 2017 Trump tax cuts provided a critical blueprint that Congress can build upon to make lasting improvements to our tax code. The House has already shown strong bipartisan support for key provisions of the 2017 law by passing the Tax Relief for American Families and Workers Act earlier this year. But there is still much work to be done. Unfortunately, President Biden has shown he is willing to throw away these hard-won gains. The president has repeatedly said that a budget is a statement of values. His most recent budget shows that he clearly values higher taxes and more inflationary spending over the well-being of the American people. The current price tag, tag on Biden's tax hikes is $5 trillion exploding to seven trillion with his suggestion to fill the gap if middle class tax cuts are extended. Here's the bottom line. Congress must act soon to prevent what will be the largest tax hike in history on workers, families, farmers, and small businesses. If the 2017 tax cuts expire, the average family of four earning $75,000 will see their taxes increase by $1,500 a year, starting in 2026. A family of five with two earners making around $100,000 would see a tax increase of nearly $7,500 a year. President Biden and many other Democrats have called for repeal of the Trump tax cuts. Republicans won't let that happen because middle income earners 
will be hit the hardest by the coming tax hikes. Small businesses will also face massive hardship with the expiration of the 199A small business deduction. We will see even more closed for business signs up and down Main Street when their federal tax rate jumps to over 40%. The hard work this committee, committee put into doubling the child tax credit, which we reaffirmed just a couple months ago in the Tax Relief for American Families and Workers Act, will be slashed in half after 2025. The safeguards we put in place to make it harder for the IRS to go after family farms and ranches will sunset after 2025. Democrats continue to rave about the economy, but they're forgetting one thing. You can't pay your mortgage, feed your family, or put gasoline in your car with a jobs report. We need pro-growth solutions that will restore the economy we had under President Trump. Our committee has already made progress on pro-growth and pro-family tax policies this Congress. Now we need to come together and look at other ways we can strengthen our competitive edge against China and ensure our tax code is a help, not a hindrance, to workers, families, farmers, and small businesses just trying to get by. I'm pleased to recognize Ranking Member Nill for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we don't want to disappoint you, Mr. Chairman, in terms of the script. <laughs> <laughs> Republicans have now wasted the last 16 months on chaos, conspiracies, and of course, talk of more tax cuts, only to end up back where they always do, proposing to cut taxes for wealthy, and well-connected people. I've been around long enough to know that the life cycle of this governing goes as follows. Cut taxes for special interests, the top 1 percent, and then take away basic benefits for middle-income Americans and those at the lower end of the economic spectrum. Complain about debt, complain about costs, and then demand, when there's a Democratic president, that we should balance the budget. I was here long enough to see the Bush tax cuts in 201 and 203, $2.3 trillion worth of tax cuts while we simultaneously fought two wars and had and witnessed the collapse of Wall Street. In the last three decades, our Republican colleagues have skyrocketed the deficit with trillions of dollars in tax cuts, largely for people who don't need them and, in my memory, for people who weren't even asking for them. But always with the same result, the top 1 percent will benefit with very little for the American worker. The American economy right now is humming along. Three straight years of unemployment to under 4 percent. Even productivity is up during the Biden administration. I call attention to that because the simplicity of always arguing for tax cuts takes away from the complexity of trying to govern beyond that. In 2017, Ways and Means Democrats, we saw the corporate tax cut giveaway for what it was, a scam. We knew that this plan would disproportionately benefit the wealthy and the well-connected. We knew it wouldn't pay for itself, which I hope we'll have a thorough opportunity to discuss this afternoon. We also knew that there were large corporations and that were not workers who would not benefit. Six years since that tax plan was signed into law, we've been proven right on every single count. It didn't pay for itself, it didn't increase revenue, and it certainly did not increase wages. A recent study whose authors included the JCT, a well-regarded group in this town, let this idea I'm about to offer sink in. They found that all of the corporate tax gains from C TCJA went to shareholders and high-paid executives. If you wonder what's driving the political debate in America right now and the populism that has engulfed the left and the right in the base, this has been a big contributor. There is very little that has really flowed to average workers from those tax cuts. 56 percent of the tax cuts enrich shareholders. The remaining 44 percent lined the pockets of many executives. Zero percent went to workers. A repeat, zero. Democrats took a different path, and now our economy is the strongest in the world. And think of the recovery that we've witnessed compared to the rest of the world. 
America's economic boom continues to defy expectations. 15 million jobs created during the presidency of Joe Biden. That might even get close to the 22 million jobs that were created during Bill Clinton's presidency. Wages and wealth are on the rise, and consumer confidence is reaching new highs. This is no accident. Our investments in American workers and families have powered this record growth, new jobs in clean energy, manufacturing, lower health care and energy costs, and holding wealthy tax evaders accountable. We have proof that when you use the tax code to invest in those who need it most, we all benefit. Workers, families, and our communities should come first. In the words of Joe Biden, grow the economy because that hurts nobody. And our workers aren't asking for much, just a fair shot to unlock, unlock the fullest potential of that worker. They need basic workplace supports because it's the road that gets you not just to work, but to success in American life. It's child care that helps to keep you there, and it's paid leave that will keep you employed. What if we invested in our children the way that many on this panel would invest in the corporate salaries of top executives? There are 20 years of data showing trickle-down economics doesn't work, and yet today we will see, again, a revisionist history of wishful thinking on a large failure of fiscal policy in decades. If workers and middle class are actually your priorities, let's put them ahead of big corporations and billionaires as we proceed. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ranking Member Neal. I will now introduce our, our witnesses. Senator Phil Graham is senior advisor to U.S. Policy Metrics and former chairman of the Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs in the United States Senate. We have Dr. Paul Winfrey is president and CEO of the Economic Policy Innovation Center and the former deputy assistant to the president for domestic policy. We have Michael Irvin is the founder and co-owner of Coal River Coffee Company in Santa Albans, West Virginia. We have Austin Ramirez is the president and CEO of Husco International based in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Um, and then Dr. Catherine Ann Edwards is a PhD labor economist and public policy consultant. Thank you all for joining us today. Your written statements will be made part of the hearing record and you each have five minutes to deliver remarks. Senator Graham, you may begin when you're ready. Hold on, okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and Ranking Member Neal, I appreciate having an opportunity to be here today. I'm afraid I talk slow, so I better get moving. Um, any discussion of the merits of the 2017 tax cut has got to begin with talking about the corporate tax cut, which took America from the highest corporate rate in the world uh, to a 21% rate, which was roughly the average rate of all developed countries in the world. All available, available evidence suggests that the tax cut and reductions in regulatory burden that occurred at the same time were, that, it was imp that the tax cut was implemented uh, caused real gross national product to rise by 3% in 2018, the highest growth rate in 13 years. Now, there was no big deal about a 3% rate of growth since it had been the average prior to 2008. What was an extraordinarily big deal, and one that I hope this committee will recognize, is that there was a dramatic change uh, in median household income, which soared, and the poverty rate, which plummeted. Uh, as a longtime student of tax policy and a former member of the Senate Finance Committee, I was astonished at the unexpected depth and breadth of the benefits that flowed from the 2017 tax cut. According to the Census Bureau, and I want to put this information in the record so people have it, real median household income surged the year after the tax cut by $5,220. That's almost 50% larger in inflation-adjusted dollars than the next highest income gain and 11 times the average annual gain since 1967. Every quintile of earners 
saw their income go up by a record amount in the last 50 years. The bottom quintile saw their income rise by 9.4% in real dollars. The second quintile saw their income rise by 7.4%. The third quintile, 6.9%. The fourth quintile, 7.8%. And the top quintile by 7.2%. And those figures are from the Census Bureau. Uh, the poverty rate plummeted by the most in a half a century, hitting a new low. Now, this is a startling statement, and I'd appreciate it if everybody listened to it. No tax change or spending increase in over 50 years by the United States government delivered so great an impact on median income and poverty. Now, how did that happen? Uh, obviously, owners of public companies benefited. Stock markets soared in 2017 in anticipation of the tax cut 2018 and 19 in response to it. But who owns these stocks? According to the tax notes, 72% of the value of all domestically held stocks are owned by pension plans, 401ks, IRAs, and charitable organizations or are held by life insurance companies to fund annuities and benefits. Corporate tax rates receive less attention than personal income tax rates only because Americans don't understand that corporations pay no taxes. A corporation is just a pass-through legal structure, a piece of paper generally filed in a filing cabinet in Delaware. That's what a corporation is. When, corpor when the corporate tax rate is increased, corporations try to pass the cost on to the consumer to the degree that the entire cost is not passed to the consumer, the tax, in the, the tax increase is then passed to workers and investors. Now, economists have studied this in great detail, and most economic studies suggest that 50 to 70 percent of the corporate tax increase is borne by workers, and 30 to 50 percent is borne by investors. If you consume, the corporate tax rate hits you at least once. If you consume and work for a corporation, it hits you twice. If you consume, work, and invest your retirement funds in corporate equities, it hits you three times. Many Americans don't pay individual income taxes, but all Americans pay corporate taxes. In fact, a recent Treasury study done by the Obama I mean by the Biden Treasury confirms that 92.6 million families. 49.5% of all families in this country pay more corporate taxes than they pay individual income taxes. All this suggests to me that Congress consistently underappreciates the burden of the corporate tax rate uh, and doesn't pay enough attention to it. Now, let me sum up since I'm running out of time. Senator Graham, we're over a minute, almost a minute and a half. Oh, I'm first. sorry. Well, so I'll stop. We'll, we'll, we'll get to you in questions. Um, Dr. Winfrey. Thanks so much. I was thinking about yielding some time there to Graham because he was on a roll. Uh, uh, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Neal, members of the committee, thanks for having us to uh, testify today. Wonderful opening remarks and very interesting comments, Senator Graham. In 2017, Congress and President Trump enacted monumental tax legislation that reduced the tax burden on Americans and American businesses. At the time of enactment, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was estimated by a wide range of economists to increase investment by reducing the cost of capital while also lowering marginal tax rates. These effects were estimated to increase the size of the economy, generate additional opportunities, and increase disposable incomes for Americans at every level of the income distribution. Estimates of the TCJ's effects on economic growth range from about 0.3% of GDP on the low end to over 2% of GDP on the high end. 
Any extent to which the TCJA was anticipated to depress output was associated with the fiscal effects of deficit financing and could have, that could have triggered higher interest rates and thus created a drag on the economy. One of the issues that limited the growth potential of the TCJA was the expiration of provisions that reduced taxes on investment. Under current law, many of the components of the TCJA will expire at the end of 2025. That's what we're talking about today. However, we cannot view the expiration of these provisions without also considering what has changed about the broader economy as well as the nation's fiscal position since 2017. The nation's fiscal position has deteriorated over the past several years. Since 2020, debt held by the public has increased by $9.1 trillion. This year, roughly $8.9 trillion in Treasury bonds will mature, and the deficit is projected to be about $1.5 trillion. Between the beginning of 2020 and the end of 2023, new bonds paid for 76% of all new spending. Money creation paid for 14%, and tax revenues paid for about 7%. The federal government has not relied so heavily on debt and money creation to finance new spending since the Civil War. The increase in debt associated with the pandemic era spending means that the Department of Treasury will need roughly $10 trillion in additional borrowing authority in 2024 alone to roll over existing debt and to pay for new debt during a period when the Federal Reserve is reducing the size of its balance sheet to reduce inflation. Under CBO's baseline that assumes no new wars, recessions, pandemics, relatively high potential growth, and relatively low interest rates, the rate at which debt is expected to grow will soon become so significant that it could cause the U.S. government to enter what is called a debt spiral. At that point, interest rates will increase, fiscal space will evaporate, and it will become necessary to reduce the deficit to achieve a primary surplus. In a recent paper, I estimate that this could begin happening around 2035 under current law or 2032 under current policy. In other words, extending the current policy baseline, including tax cuts, only pulls the debt spiral forward by three years. This highlights the underlying problem of the federal budget being spending growth or the unsustainable growth in spending. My estimate suggests that to delay the debt spiral from happening over the next 20 years, the federal government would need to implement a primary deficit reduction, that is not including interest, of about $2.1 trillion before 2035 without compromising economic growth, and that's an important point. These broader fiscal challenges also have effects on American households. Given the reliance on debt and money creation, it's no wonder that the hidden tax of inflation has put pressure on American budgets. Between June of 2021 and May of 2023, inflation grew considerably faster than average earnings. That difference, or the wedge between the cost of living and, er and uh, earnings, remains a significant economic challenge. Households have lost real purchasing power even as inflation has slowed down. Therefore, any policy that puts additional pressure on household budgets or small businesses would be unwarranted. This includes allowing the tax cuts to expire, which would reduce take-home pay and investment. Policymakers are going to face a number of challenges over the next uh, several years. It will be necessary to implement a balanced approach that does not raise taxes on the middle class and does not put additional pressure on the debt. Congress can accomplish this by pairing legislation to prevent tax increases with provisions that broaden and the correct the tax base, reductions in the growth in spending, and other policies such as removing regulatory burdens that grow the economy. In essence, you cannot look at the tax question in a silo. You have to look at it with everything else that the federal government is doing. With that, I'll yield back the remainder of my time and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Irvin. You may proceed. Good afternoon, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Neal, and members of the House Committee on Ways and Means. My name is Michael Irvin. I'm the founder of Coal River Coffee Company in St. Albans, West Virginia. Thank you for having me here today. Less than 10 years ago, I was like many average Americans, a man with a dream to start a small business. I started roasting coffee as a hobby in my garage, and my wife thought it was really delicious and thought maybe someday someone might want to buy it. So we took a chance and founded Coal River Coffee Company in 2018, uh, not only to make money, but also to hopefully spark a revitalization, an economic revitalization in small town America, in particular Appalachia, and to prove that a thriving Main Street business is possible. Currently, we are accomplishing this goal and hope to see more growth in the future. Right now, we employ over a dozen people in our community, 
Additionally, I coach and train other Main Street business owners throughout my region. 2018 was a landmark year, not only for small business, but also for the tax code. After the passage of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, LLCs and other pastor businesses like mine were able to benefit from the newly minted small business deduction, also known as 199A deduction. This provision has allowed me to deduct up to 20% of my business income, which has let me invest in my business, my employees, and in my community. We've been able to increase my employees' hourly wages, invest in equipment, grow from a single location to four iterations, create a mobile location, and sell my Main Street Roasted Coffee internationally. However, in less than two years, our business will be facing a huge, significant tax hike unless Congress acts to extend and make permanent the small business deduction. Not only will my 20% small business deduction go away, but my marginal tax rates will increase if Congress fails to act. These tax increases do not exist in a vacuum. My larger competitors like Starbucks and Tim Hortons are organized as C corporations and pay a rate of 21% federal corporate rate, which is permanent. If small business deduction lapses and my marginal rates increase, I could be staring at an effective tax rate of nearly 45% when you combine federal and state income taxes. This 45% tax is not on my take-home pay like high-wage W-2 employees. This is the tax on my business income. With a pass-through business like mine, I am taxed on business income whether I reinvest that money in my business and create new jobs or take it home as profit. Down the street from my location is a larger corp competitor, Tim Hortons. In two years, if my taxes go up, the corporate rate will remain 21%. Tim Hortons will be paying a 21% federal rate and a 6.5% state corporate rate for a total combined of 27.5%, while my total combined rate will be closer to 45%. This disparity will make it extremely difficult for me to complete our mission. I'm not asking for special treatment, but I am asking that small businesses get treated equally with big businesses and not be placed at a competitive disadvantage by the tax code. Tax code was meant to incentivize the economy, in incentivize entrepreneurs like myself and other like-minded small business owners in America, not to penalize us. And in two years, we're looking at a major penalty. We won't be able to reinvest in our community and create a thriving, revitalized Main Street. How many of you want to see a Main Street with more closed signs on their doors? We all love our hometowns. We all love our home states. And every one of our little small towns are struggling. And what we've been able to prove since 2018 because of this deduction is that it is possible to have a thriving mom and pop shop that not only is successful financially, but can inspire other entrepreneurs to do the same thing right where they're from. Congress still has time to act and help small businesses like mine. The small business deduction does not expire until the end of 2025. Bipartisan legislation introduced by Representative Smucker on this committee exists to make this legislation permanent. His legislation is appropriately titled the Main Street Tax Certainty Act. While the end of 2025 sounds far away, I will soon have to make long-term decisions based on the future expectations. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share my story with you guys today. I look forward to answering any questions that you might have. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Mr. Ramirez. Good afternoon, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Neal, and members of the committee. My name is Austin Ramirez, and I'm the president and CEO of Husco, a privately held family-owned business uh, located in Waukesha, Wisconsin. At Husco, we produce critical hydraulic components for both passenger cars and off-highway vehicles. Husco is a uniquely American success story. My dad came to the States from Puerto Rico as a six-year-old and grew up to earn a master's degree in aerospace engineering and an MBA from Harvard. He started working at the Husco division of a larger conglomerate in the 1980s before eventually leading a management buyout to establish Husco as a standalone business. At the time, my mom complained to the neighbors that he had mortgaged the house and burned through our college funds to make his vision for Husco a reality. I took on the mantle of CEO in 2011 after 26 years of his leadership. Since my dad founded Husco in 1985, our revenues have increased from 20 million 
to over 500 million. This success has allowed us to give back to the community. We provide family supporting careers for hundreds of workers. We founded a K through 12 school on the south side of Milwaukee that is now the top rated school in the state. And we are the top corporate philanthropic donor in all of Wisconsin. In short, our story is the embodiment of the American dream, but it was made possible by American reality. The laws that all of you write in this very room have a direct, concrete impact on our ability to succeed. This is especially true when it comes to the tax code. Pro-growth tax policy allows HUSCO to create jobs, invest in R&D, and compete globally. In 2017, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act reduced taxes for job creators throughout the economy. At HUSCO, the new pass-through deduction and the reduced individual tax rates allowed us to invest nearly $50 million in the most significant renovation of our headquarters in 70 years. Tax reform was unquestionably a success, dramatically increasing the capital that manufacturers had available to invest in growth and job creation. But passing the 2017 tax reform was only the first part of the story. Now, critical tax reform provisions have begun to expire. HUSCO now has to amortize our R&D expenses, making it far more costly for us to design customized proprietary products for our customers. Debt financing is now more expensive for companies, like many manufacturers, that have significant depreciable assets. And we can no longer immediately expense the full cost of our capital equipment purchases, first forcing HUSCO to make smaller investments spread out over many years. Fortunately, the Ways and Means Committee is leading the effort to reverse these damaging changes. I want to thank each of you for passing the Tax Relief for American Families and Workers Act, and I hope the Senate will soon follow your lead. But your work is not yet done. We are rapidly approaching the final act of tax reform story. In just 20 months, small manufacturers in America will experience a series of damaging tax increases. At the end of 2025, individual tax rates will increase and individual tax brackets will decrease. These changes means that pass-through businesses like Husco will have more of our income subject to a higher rate of tax. At the same time, the pass-through deduction will expire completely, doubling down on the tax hikes that we face. We'll also see an increase in the estate tax, making it more difficult for family-owned manufacturers to pass their business on to the next generation. In R&D expensing, interest deductibility, and accelerated depreciation will be back on the chopping block. 2025 will be nothing short of a tax reckoning as Congress decides how to end the tax reform story. And the stakes are high. Allowing tax reform to sunset will undermine much of the progress we've made since 2017. At HUSCO, tax hikes will slow our growth and prevent us from investing in job-creating projects that support our community and our economy. Tax reform was a historic step towards a competitive tax code for manufacturers in America, but it was only the first step. Congress must act now to restore expired provisions and be prepared to act in 2025 to forestall even more damaging tax increases. Only by preserving the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act can Congress ensure that uniquely American stories like Husco remain possible and that companies like ours can prosper here at home and compete on the world stage. Thank you for having me today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Smith and Mr. Neal, for having me. Policy evaluation comes down to three questions. What did the policy intend to do? What did it actually do? And what did it cost? The 2000, so let's start with what the policy intended to do. The 2017 tax law was billed as a way to increase wages, income, and the U.S. economy. It cannot be credited with achieving either of those things. What did it actually do? The primary achievement of the 2017 tax law was that it was timed with full employment and economic recovery. Those statistics that you cite of a growing economy, of growing wages and growing income are all on trend from where they had been growing from the 2008 recession's recovery. Otherwise, it was a designed tra tax transfer to the richest. The Tax Policy Center estimates that in absolute terms, the after-tax increase in income was 67 times larger for the top 1% than it was for the middle 20%.
The difference between a lower tax bill of $61,000 for the top 1% and $900 for the middle. That's not to say that taxes weren't cut for, cut for everyone, but they weren't cut by the same amount or to the same degree. Even in percentage terms, the top 1% saw a 3% raise from the tax cut, the middle saw a 1% raise, and the bottom 20% saw a 0.4% raise from the tax cut. It didn't spur economic growth by much. The Congressional Research Service concluded that the tax law increased output by 0.2% in the year after enactment, the year in which the effect would be the largest. That was below expectations of 0.3 to 0.8%, but was still a fraction of the over 7% needed to generate growth to pay for itself. It, it's not a mystery why it didn't increase growth the way that you perhaps wanted. Tax cuts are but an arrow in the economic policy quiver, a way to boost aggregate demand to work effectively. They must be limited in scope, well-targeted, and perfectly timed. Short-term relief that goes to the people who are most likely to spend it at a time when demand is faltering, like during a recession. The law is off on all three marks. Corporate tax cuts are similarly an arrow in the quiver, one aimed at supply, increasing the after-tax income of businesses so that they can invest more in labor and capital. But unfortunately for workers, the labor investment that was made after the tax cut was concentrated amongst managers and executives with no discernible wage increase for the bottom 90%. And then there's the final question of what did it cost? The 10-year estimate for the 2017 tax law was between $1.9 and $2.25 trillion, according to the Congressional Budget Office. A quarter of that estimate was debt servicing. Even for the federal government, $2 trillion is a lot of money. For comparison, that is the equivalent of two-thirds of what Congress owes the Social Security Trust Fund. It's 25% higher than the fully refundable and expanded child tax credit that halved child poverty in a year, and it's enough to create a universal child care and preschool program in the U.S. five times over. It's enough to have universal paid family leave and medical leave for every worker in the U.S. eight times over. In addition to the opportunity cost, there's the pattern of sacrificing fiscal health. In the last three years of the 20th century, revenue as a share of GDP was over 19%. After the tax cuts in 01, 03, extensions in 12, more cuts in 17, CBO projected that revenue will be around 16% through 2026. To put that in comparison, had the federal government been collecting revenue at the rates that it had at the end of the 20th century, you would have $850 billion more each year. Bad policy, bad precedent with serious and accumulating consequences, there is no justification for extending it. I'll end with the reminder that even bad policy creates winners, but that's not the job of policy. The job of policy to be effective at its aim, and the barometer of success for economic policy is much higher. It has to be effective at addressing economic needs. So if I were to pretend for a moment that I was a nominee for the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, which is not something I'm aspiring to do, and I told you that no matter what, I was going to lower interest rates because people like paying less for houses and they like paying less for borrowing, you wouldn't, you wouldn't let me have a seat at the table because that's not the job. The job is effective economic policy, and it's not your job either. The federal government needs to raise revenue, and that is the most important conversation to have. Thank you. We'll now proceed to the question and answer session. Mr. Buchanan is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our committee uh, folks being here today, especially the senator. I've followed his uh, expertise over a lot of years. Let me start out quickly uh, with Mr. Winfrey. You touched on, I wasn't planning on going down this road, but you did touch on the debt and the deficit, I, about, you know, the problem, the challenge with that. Looking at a number today, someone put it in front of me a couple of days ago, is the debt, the, the spending this year in six months uh, for the Department of Defense is $440 billion, and the interest on the debt, I think, is $480 billion. And uh, I've seen a lot of balance sheets, been in business 30 years, built businesses from scratch, good-sized businesses, and I don't, you know, $35, 36000000000000 trillion, it doesn't, it's just a matter when it ends badly. 
So here we talk about all these other things, and I'm glad I've got some things I want to talk about today, but I do want to put that back in your lap because you opened the door a little bit about what that looks like. If you can take it just a minute or so and tell us your thoughts on it. Sure, thanks so much. As I mentioned, I don't think that you can look at the expiration of the TCJA or any of the other fiscal inflection points that, that this committee and this Congress is gonna to have to deal with over the next 24 months in, in a silo. Uh, and you have to take the debt, uh, you have to take the debt question um, at, at hand. I mean, one of the things that we've seen is rates on short-term treasuries uh, increase uh, by almost five percentage points just over the last four years, right? Th that's the market trying to tell us something, right? It's trying to tell us to get control of the debt question. And I, you know, I, I, I have to commend the committee uh, on the bill that, that was passed earlier this year um, that uh, my colleague Austin uh, referred to earlier. Hey, doctor, uh, let me move on. I only got sorry, five yeah. minutes. Thank you. Mr. Irwin, I wanted to Explain a little bit more, just in a minute or so, the 199A, the, how important that is, that 20% reduction. We went corporate rates 35 to 20, 21, and we're still looking at 39.6%, but there was a reduction of 199A, which is 20%, which is huge. And it's not like you take all the money home, put it in your mattress, you use it to grow and expand your business. So take a second on that. Thank you. So if we don't have that deduction, I'll just go this direction. If we don't have that deduction, there are some things that I am personally going to lose as a business owner. Um, one of those in particular is putting back into my community. We do a lot of philanthropic work, thankfully, and that was always one of the goals. One example is that we have a partnership with the West Virginia Collegiate Recovery Network. And with that partnership, we have developed a coffee roast that we sell and the profits go directly to a scholarship for people that have gone through recovery, are in college, and this will help them and reward them for their progress. That would be threatened in a major way. This is something that we are intrinsically changing lives for because of this deduction. Also, we have inspired uh, organizations to begin. Just for one, um, there's an organization called the On Purpose Project. What it does is it exists to help our community, help Mr. communities. Irwin, I, yes. I only got one, one sure. more question. Go ahead. Mr. Ramirez, uh, is, you're talking about full expensing, uh, the power of that. For many years, it was you write something off over five years, then we had bonus depreciation, you get 50%, 10% for five years, but now the full expensing. There's my opinion, there's nothing more powerful tool, whether you're buying or selling, than full expensing, and it's a timing issue. But what's your thoughts? Yeah, accelerated depreciation, thank you, Congressman. Accelerated depreciation does two things. One, it gives me more liquidity, more, more cash now to make more investments, and it improves the return on the investments that I make. So when you have accelerated depreciation, I'm going to make bigger, faster investments. When I don't have accelerated depreciation... You're going to get that depreciation anyway over five years, so why not create the incentive of getting it up front? That's my point. That's right. It creates, when you have accelerated depreciation, the cash cost to me in the year I make the investment is lower. I have more cash to invest in more equipment. Do you find yourself you're either buying or selling more than maybe you would otherwise, ideally, because of the deduction for tax planning and other things? Absolutely. With accelerated depreciation, we're going to pull investments forward. We're going to invest more now. And it also stimulates the broader economy. So not only does it impact us in a micro way, us making bigger investments, but throughout the supply chain that happens and that stimulates demand. Let me just say one thing, that a lot, when you're able to keep more money, people always say, why is that so important? Because you're the job creators in America. Most businesses are 50 employees or less. 90% of businesses that are organized are 50 employees or less. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Neal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Dr. Edwards, as you know, uh, our colleagues often in support and defense of the TCJA, they really distort and move away from the really important issue that distributional tables tell. They lump all taxpayers together into one undifferentiated group and then claim that they quote, an average taxpayer receives a significant benefit from TCJA. Your research, however, into the law's distributional effects paints a very different picture for taxpayers or in the lowest three quintiles of income distribution. 
Could you please reiterate for us how the 2017 tax cuts were distributed across income groups? Yes, so the top 1% saw a reduction in taxes of $61,000, an increase of post-tax income of 3%. Uh, the middle 20% in income quintile uh, saw a reduction of taxes of $910. Uh, that's a difference of about 1.3%. The lowest 20th, the lowest quintile, the bottom 20%, uh, saw a reduction in taxes of $70 a difference of 0.4 percent. So your testimony also states that taxpayers who receive the largest tax cuts aren't necessarily the ones spending the extra cash. Why is that important? Well, the discussion? mechanism by which we think a tax cut grows the economy is that when you give households money, they then go out and spend it. So for the tax cut to be most effective, it has to go to those most, most likely to spend it immediately. The problem with most tax cuts as they're legislated is that the people who pay the most in taxes and the people who receive the largest cuts are those also least likely to immediately spend it. Right? If you have sufficient income, you don't, you don't have to run out to the grocery store if you got more money. This is a lesson that I think Congress knows very well because during recessions, um, in 2008, in, 2000, or in 2008, in 2009, um, and during the pandemic, the stimulus checks were in fact tax rebates that were limited into which households received them and sent out as a one-time check. That, that's exactly how tax policy is meant to increase aggregate demand. So in your testimony, you also discussed how not all tax cuts are created equal. And we know that to be true in both the nature of the tax cut and the timing of the tax cut. So I'd like you to reflect on the latter part of this question. The timing? Yes. You know, the 2007 to 2009 recession I will always say earned its title as being the Great Recession and the hole that it left in the labor market took almost seven years to recover from. But when that recovery did occur, the U.S. economy was growing at a healthy clip, increasing income and wages every year. The tax cut essentially fell right in the middle of it, which is why it's really not credited with any of the growth that happened after the fact. It's you know, happening at the same time doesn't mean one causing the other. The economy's tailwinds of a 4% unemployment rate just matters so much more than that tax policy. So on the heels of the balanced budgets of Bill Clinton's administration, the next administration, President Bush, they enacted two tax cuts, $1.3 trillion in 2001 and another trillion in 2003, which we have never recovered from fiscally, including two wars. Then, of course, there were the irresponsible tax cuts in 2017. You outlined in your testimony that there is a time in terms of perspective to talk about tax cuts, and there's a time to suggest that those tax cuts, as proposed, don't make any sense. Do you want to elaborate? I, uh, I will give credit that the 2005 President's Commission on Bipartisan Tax Reform that made it, you know, with a mandate to make it simple, fair, and pro-growth, that Chairman Connie Mack said in his executive summary, we have lost sight of the fact that the fundamental purpose of our tax system is to raise revenue to fund government. Sometimes you need a tax cut. Sometimes you just need to pay the bills. This is a moment, as many have been alarming, I was in the Joint Economic Committee three months ago when they discussed the end of the republic. You need to pay your bills. You, you must raise revenue. Sure. I'm just going to finish with this because frequently my experience here is the following. Republicans complain about government spending when there's a Democrat sitting in the White House. I've seen that through my career. Bill Clinton should balance the budget. Barack Obama should balance the budget. And now Joe Biden should balance the budget. Republican presidents should cut taxes. And there's a huge differential there, but it's been part, I think, of the tension that exists as we talk about fiscal policy. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Smith. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to our panel. Uh, great perspectives. Uh, Senator, welcome back to Capitol Hill. Your uh, service and your priorities uh, while you served and currently serving as well are certainly appreciated. We worked very hard on tax reform that culminated in 2017. It didn't start that year. It started, I would say, uh, perhaps even before 2011, but uh, that's when we started gathering in a bipartisan basis with working groups that I found to be very productive. And throughout that discussion, even President Obama acknowledged that we needed to be more competitive worldwide on the corporate tax side. 
Now, I don't think anyone would think it wise to just give corporations a tax cut and, and nothing on the personal side or the family side. And so that's why a TCJA was a very well thought out approach to tax reform. Uh, Broad-based tax reform, by the way. Both sides up here want to want to give tax relief, but very differently, I might add, and I don't have time to get into that. But we wanted to make sure that small businesses, as you, uh, as our witnesses pointed out here today, also benefited, and and I think uh, the numbers speak for themselves. And I'm glad to say that we had a very bipartisan vote the other day to return us to uh, a 2017 policy that we found to be very productive. And when I say productive, I mean in terms of revenue, but also our priority in 2017 with TCJA was to increase productivity across the economy. And I will tell you, it's my speculation, but I think that we are in a much stronger place today because of the priorities of productivity in 2017 that increased wages, and like I said, increased that productivity that we can all benefit from in fact, our, our supply chain would be far worse off now if, if we hadn't have, had done that. So uh, I, I'm, I'm puzzled as to some of the comments. Of course, it, it, uh, it's somewhat uh, predictable, but you know, around this town, there's such demonization of prosperity. You'd never know that our tax code depends very heavily on prosperity so that we can pay our bills, because I think paying our bills is important. Mr. Ramirez, I certainly appreciate your story, um, uh, personal story, certainly, of uh, your father, uh, uh, leading the way to, uh, to buy a, a business that he was working in, employing local workers, incredible story. I, I certainly appreciated that uh, you called out the importance of the increased death tax exemption for helping keep family businesses local and family run. I think a, a good priority. The same is true, I would add, for farmers, ranchers, and family-owned manufacturers in my own district. I hear from them all of the time, especially as it relates to this. Now, a recurring tax proposal from the Biden administration is the repeal of the stepped-up basis. Um, it would add just as uh, it would be just as detrimental to family businesses, I might add, uh, taxing supposed gains on, for example, the value of your family business, which you've never actually realized. So, could you discuss what the repeal of the stepped-up basis would look like as you think about the future of your business? Thank you, Congressman. Um, i just like to note, I think family businesses are an indispensable part of the U.S. Uh, economic system. You know, we take long investment horizons, um, we invest in our communities, we have consistency of leadership, and, you know, you want policy that encourages multi-generational family businesses. And both stepped-up basis and the death tax do the opposite. They make it more difficult for families to maintain businesses and have, uh, you know, these entities pass from one generation to the next. Thank you. Anyone else uh, wish to... Uh comment on the impact of uh, repealing a stepped-up basis? Dr. Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Smith. I, you know, I realize I'm the bad guy at this end of the table, but I would like to point out that I do think family businesses are important, but not to the disadvantage of people who didn't have rich parents. You know, I, I have a friend who Would you was, believe the government is entitled to take a large chunk of the value of that family business? We had the government taking a similar large chunk up until year, you know, the law went into effect, and we still had many family businesses and small businesses and, and small proprietors. It, I, okay, I just wonder if you would Reclaiming my time, I think it's important to note that a, a family business or a family would have to take out a loan. And this is a, a fairly common situation where a family would have to take out a loan in order to just maintain the family business. Uh, we used to have a member of this committee, now governor of South Dakota, uh, very articulately uh, told, it, uh, told her story. That, to me, is not what America should be about. We, of course we need modest tax policy so that we can pay our bills. Let's not penalize uh, uh, individuals. Senator, turn on your microphone. If you eliminate the step up in basis, you're going to pay a 20% tax on the gain of anything you ever owned in your life, and then when you die, you're going to pay a 40% death tax. You pay taxes on every penny you earn when you earned it. So when we're talking about taking 60% of people's life's work, that's just not America. And maybe you want the money. Maybe you think you could spend it better than their children and grandchildren. But the point is, the person who is paying that tax earned it. They created it and they created jobs, growth, and opportunity in the process. 
That's, that, that sounds like a great conclusion. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Doggett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I think this hearing certainly does illustrate that our committee and our country have two very distinct paths. One path follows Donald Trump, the clever genius as he describes himself, the self-styled king of debt, and the sorry legacy of the 2017 tax law and the estimated $2 trillion in red ink that it added to our nation's debt, and all the failed promises of trickle-down economics. Who benefited from this budget-busting, king-of-debt effort? Well, best place to look is Donald Trump himself. Just last weekend, in a $50 million fundraiser uh, at a Palm Beach home of a billionaire hedge fund investor, Trump boasted about how much he'd done to help the rich get richer and that he'd do the same once again. The heart of the Trump tax scam was a massive budget-busting 40% cut in the corporate tax rate. Because that was the top priority for Trump and Republicans, they made the corporate tax cut permanent and left everybody else hanging with temporary. In the first year after these tax cuts, the nonpartisan Joint Committee on Taxation determined that the largest 88 American multinationals paid an average tax rate of 7.8%. Indeed, the 55 large profitable corporations, uh, 55 large corporate uh, corporations paid no tax whatsoever in 2018, and 23 have not paid any tax at all in the five years since the law was passed. Meanwhile, we know that a single mom with two children who earns the average wage pays an effective tax rate for all of her federal taxes, including payroll, of 20%. It may be that corporations don't pay taxes, but you'd never know it from the horde of corporate lobbyists that descend on this committee like a plague of locusts whenever a, a corporate tax bill is up. Um, Dr. Edwards, I'd ask you, what evidence is there that these cuts for large corporations and the wealthiest few ever trickled down to help that single mother who was paying a higher tax rate than these big corporations? I would... Uh... I would say that a $2 trillion investment shouldn't be so hard to find the benefits of for the workers who it was intended for. Uh, there have been some academic debates of researchers looking for investment to trickle down to workers, and they, they haven't found it to a large degree. The best evidence was that the majority of pay raises that came after the corporate tax cuts were concentrated amongst managers and executives. Um, thank you. Well, and uh, if the tax cuts aren't trickling down to help the single mom, it's also important to realize that the same Republicans who boosted the debt with their tax breaks uh, are the same ones who want to cut uh, benefits when it comes to Social Security and Medicare. Uh, we haven't had a real balanced budget since President Clinton, and $10 trillion has been added in debt from a couple of rounds of Bush tax cuts and the Trump tax cuts. Uh, we've got uh, a number of members of this committee, uh, a significant number of Republicans in the House who've called for big changes in Social Security and Medicare because they, they say we can't afford to keep providing them at the current, in the current way. I think it's also significant, and Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent to put in the record uh, a new study from Steve Rosenthal and Livia Muccio uh, that show that foreign investors own 42 percent of all American corporate stock. Uh, they were among those who were the greatest beneficiaries of this massive 40 percent reduction in the corporate tax rate. So ordered. Meanwhile, the same tax law provides tax incentives, and I certainly agree with you, Mr. Urban, that we do need our tax laws to treat small businesses the way that corporations are treated. Unfortunately, corporations are given under the Trump tax law an incentive to shift their factories abroad because they pay half of the corporate tax rate on their investments overseas as to what they do here. There's so much more that needs to be done. I think a trade war with uh, our allies is the wrong way to go, and a global minimum tax that stops the rates to the bottom is the right way to deal with uh, our future. And I yield back. Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Chairman. I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, Senator Graham, I wanted to go to you because I think you had a lot more to say. Uh, I do talk faster than you, but I want you to go ahead and go through because you were leading into and some, some questions we really have on 
jurisdictional rights and who has the right to enter into agreements, tax agreements around the world. I just want, if you could pick it up, because as you started talking about, if you consume, uh, if you consume the corporate tax rate hits you, and then if you go down through that, because uh, you only have a couple of paragraphs here, but I would really like you to dwell on that, because it seems to me, for a long time, before I ever got here, I listened to you, uh, because I thought that everything you said was spot on. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, if large corporations are not paying taxes, it's because you gave them deductions which they're using. So if you don't want them to have the deductions, take them back. But in raising the rate is the wrong way to go about it. In my opinion, we have a lot of industrial policy in the tax code. I would love for it to be eliminated, and I'd love for the rates to go down. In talking about who pays the tax, the bottom 30% of Americans pay zero in, in income tax. Um, the top 1% pay 45.5% of all the income taxes. So needless to say, when you're cutting taxes, you affect taxpayers. The only way people get a tax cut when they are not paying taxes is welfare. Now, we call it a refundable tax credit, but you're giving people money they didn't earn to begin with. Now, let, let me address the issue, if I can, about what the tax bill actually did. The bottom 20% of income earners in America got the largest share of income growth from the 2017 tax cut. Now, that's a census number, and it doesn't even count refundable tax credits because the census does not count any tax change as a change in income. So the largest beneficiary in percentage terms, no matter how you want to say it by distorting the figures, in comparing tax cuts to people that pay taxes with tax cuts to people that don't pay taxes, the biggest beneficiary in terms of income was the bottom 20% of income earners. And look, how did they get the benefit? They got jobs. A job is a better housing program, a better welfare program, a better food stamp program, a better child care program than any program ever adopted by this Congress. In fact, of all the programs passed by Democrats and Republicans, no program, or at least for no year, has anything outdone your cut in the corporate tax rate. That's what's amazing to me. I never expected that to be the case. The tax cut was small. $160 billion a, ye a year, and yet it produced this extraordinary result. Why? Because everybody pays corporate taxes. Because when we cut corporate taxes, the two job creators sitting in the middle saw it possible, but found it possible to expand their business. And that's the, that's the miracle of this tax cut you adopted. So in talking about the fact that the bottom 50% of income earners got no tax cut. The bottom 50% of income earners in America with refundable tax credits, for all practical purposes, pay no income taxes. So I don't understand this unhappiness that people who aren't paying taxes don't get tax cuts. Tax cuts are for taxpayers. Listen, you, just the few seconds we have left. The global corporate minimum tax uh, and the, how it circumvents the Constitution, just as quick as you can. Because yeah, I I'll tell you as quickly as I can. Really a, this is the greatest the abuse of the Constitution of the United States in my lifetime was President Biden going to Europe and negotiating a minimum corporate income tax and giving them the power to tax corporate income in America, but if you don't raise the tax rate. It was extortion committed against the Congress. And I can't imagine, at any day that I served in the House and Senate, any president, Republican or Democrat, that I would not have opposed 
that circumvention of the Constitution. This global corporate minimum tax is an extraordinary abuse which every member of Congress ought to be against. Totally agree. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the witnesses for being here today. Uh, you know, over the years, this committee has met many times to consider major reforms to our tax code. And I'm struck today by how little the majority's arguments have changed uh, over the past 40 years. Tax reform in 1981, 1986, 2001, 2003, and 2017. Every time, the Republican message has been the same. Slash taxes for rich people, and the benefits trickle down to everyday Americans. My Republican colleagues evidently still believe that tax cuts pay for themselves. Cutting taxes on the wealthy is a good way to help the middle class, and that children's health programs add to the deficit, but tax cuts for the wealthy don't. None of these things are bore out by any of the evidence, and that's what I'd like to focus on today. So Dr. Edwards, I particularly appreciate the way you described how this committee should evaluate our policy decisions. What did the policy intend to do? What did it actually do? And what did it cost? Those are the key questions. And as you point out, it's not enough to just look at what the 2017 tax cuts did. We have to also look at what they cost, particularly relative to other things we could have spent that money on. Given the TCGA cost, was it worth it? Has it paid for itself? It hasn't paid for itself, but that's a very unreasonable bar for any piece of legislation. I, would, I don't think it's a productive part of conversation to say that one thing would pay for itself versus not. I don't think it was worth it well short of not paying for itself. I'd also like to draw a contrast here in the terms of our priorities. Dr. Edwards, as you know, Democrats in this committee passed the Enhanced Child Tax Credit in the American Rescue Plan. That credit lifted millions of children out of poverty. And while we've passed bipartisan legislation making improvements to the current CTC, my Democratic colleagues and I would like to fully restore the credit to the ARP levels. Dr. Edwards, which do you think would do more for low-income children and families? reinstating the fully refundable expanded uh, CTC or extending tax cuts that prim uh, primarily uh, accrue to the 1 percent? Well, that's a softball. It's going to be giving them. It's going to be giving every the Every once kids. in a while, you need a softball. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be giving. It, I, I, it's, a, it's a lesson for policy design that you will hopefully hit where you're aiming. If you want to help children in low-income families, you should just direct policy right to them and not get an intermediary of their employer or their corporation. It's, it's not to say that money can't be spent beneficially in the corporate side, but if you want to help workers, you should give money to workers. Uh, you know, one of the studies I cited showed that some workers did benefit in their capacity as shareholders of corporations that received more money, which is just very much not the same thing as a wage increase. And uh, Dr. Edwards, uh, you highlighted uh, here that uh, what we face are trade-offs. Uh, do we have to direct our federal resources to the wealthiest in our society? Uh, but my colleagues across the aisle are promoting the extension of the 2017 tax reforms, are choosing to do just that. And we would be doing so at the expense of policies that would really help working families, as you just uh, articulated, in every one of our districts. Uh, that's something that uh, I think we should, uh, we, we should consider. And before I yield back, I just want to mention one thing. Uh, the conversation today got a little off topic regarding uh, uh, a state tax and a state tax reform. And it was mentioned that you shouldn't have to pay taxes after you die. And I just want to, for the record, point out, once you die, you don't pay any taxes. Yield back. No, but your family members do. Um, Mr. Schweikert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Winfrey. Um, uh, thank you. You actually had some very interesting things in the written portion of your testimony. I, I want to take you to something that's a little more difficult. Um, and first off, in your opening testimony, I, I actually think the m most updated CBO numbers, OMB numbers, are actually much darker 
Um, yesterday's Treasury statement said just interest this year will be one trillion one hundred, I think, forty six billion. And that was before they calculated in the most recent um, inflation data with the new interest rate pops. So I come to you and say, okay, I appreciate a, a debate of relitigating, you know, their spending on Inflation Reduction Act and, you know, corporate welfare and their tax of us on trying to do a more progressive income tax system, which is what happened, you know, with our tax cuts. Fine. From today forward, you're the consultant for this committee. How do you walk us through to how do we maximize economic expansion because growth is moral and at the same time stabilizing the fact that two days ago we broke through over borrowing over $100,000 a second, a 365 average we're now borrowing close to or over 100,000 a second. So walk us through the truth. What do we do to maximize economic growth and stabilize receipts? Uh, again, it's a holistic approach. I think that it starts with the administration. There's a lot that can be done on regulatory reform uh, to free up these guys, to create more jobs, to create more growth. And there's a lot that you can do to oversee the regulation that's going on within the, within the administrative branch. On the tax issue, really what we're talking about here, and I think that, you know, um, I think we're missing something. And that is, is that we're talking about two different philosophies, right? Philosophy one is lower rates and, lower, and fewer carve-outs and philosophy number two is higher rates and more carve-outs. And I need you to back up and sort of, because sure. let's make sure everyone understands. Uh, let's use the term base broadening yep. instead of carve-outs, just so that we're all using the same lingo. Yeah. Walk me through that. So, sure. So you need more people with skin in the game, right? You need more people who are ultimately taxpayers and treat everybody ultimately the same. And with that, again, it frees up these guys uh, who w know way more about payroll and creating wealth than a budget nerd in Washington, D.C. Um, to go out and do what they do best, right? The American people are incredibly innovative. It's one of the things that has held us together for the last 250 years. And if we treat them fairly and we treat the tax code fairly, then ultimately these guys can, can, can go out and, and create more growth. Um, one of my concerns, and I've done, tried to do multiple presentations, is we have, we have a demographic issue. Um, a couple days ago, um, I think it was either OMB or one of the others updated that just Medicare spend will be up 10% this year. Sure. Um, at our current burn rate, if you do just the, the, the true total debt, we are right now borrowing a not 9.6% of the economy yeah. in this year. So the model on all the tax hikes on $400,000 and up when you're just for economic impact, you get a point and a half of GDP. Most of us who want to cut things, I can find about a point and a half of GDP. I got a math problem. Mm -hmm. The tax hikes and the cuts don't get me anywhere near when we're borrowing 9.6% of the economy in a single year. And if these interest rates continue to you know, normalize, right. we're walking into a level of financial brutality. Um, okay, so you have regulatory. Mm -hmm. um, we've got to change the cost of delivering health care. Walk me through one more time. What does your base broadening look like? One of the things that we have not talked about today is that the thing that is expiring next year are the individual rates, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why the 2017 tax bill was popular at the time, and I think still continues to be popular with the middle class, is that it lowers rates and it also increases the standard deduction, right? Which, which decreases the number of itemizers in the tax code. And that, that itself, again, brings more people to the table. And I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not speaking just as a budget and tax policy guy here. I'm speaking as an American. I think that if we allow those tax 
cuts to go away on the middle class next year after we've seen, again, the hidden tax of inflation increase over the last few years, there will be political repercussions to that. Okay. But, but, thank you, Doctor. Sure. Um, Mr. Chairman, one of these days we're going to have to do an economic roundtable and understand just the headwinds and the, the scale of it I don't think is completely understood by anyone. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Swickard, you'd be great to lead that roundtable. Um, Mr. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank all the uh, witnesses as well for your uh, testimony. And um, um, just a couple of uh, quick questions. Um, Senator Graham, how effective is Social Security? Yeah. How what is so effective is Social Security as a uh, governmental program? Well, I'd say if you defend, depend on it, it's pretty, pretty effective. Exactly. Uh, and uh, you, you would have to rate it as one of the most successful programs in American history. Totally um, agree. And by the way, we've done a fairly good job on a bipartisan basis when we've had to make tough decisions on Social Security in doing it. Yeah, that's a good point. And, uh, but we haven't made any decision in terms of expanding Social Security in 51 years. And in fact, we're talking about uh, uh, tax cuts today. And 23 million Americans pay taxes on their Social Security. That's never mentioned. Do what do you think about Social Security, Dr. Winfrey? Well, let me, no, I'm sorry, go ahead. I think Social Security is an important program. And should it, uh, we talk about revenues all the time. This, this doesn't have anything to do with the debt or deficit. It pays for itself. Well, right. It, so it, it doesn't pay for itself, right? So oh. Social Security is facing a massive shortfall within the next 10 years. It's why? on the order of, of about $300 why, billion. Why is it facing that shortfall? Because payroll taxes are not enough to keep pace with outlays. Because there's 10,000 baby boomers a day who become eligible to collect Social Security, and Congress hasn't done anything to adjust it since 1971? Is that why there's a problem? No, 83. If it's, if you're, yeah, if it's yeah, a it was, payroll tax and it's right. deducted to provide a benefit, isn't it a simple solution just to increase the payroll tax? If you increase the payroll tax, you also have to increase the benefits, which ultimately Well, well so let me ask difficult. you something about those, those benefits. Sure. You know, we have five million Americans who work all their lives and pay in the system and get below poverty level checks from Social Security. Most of them women, women of color, et cetera. And if we're gonna build a system based on what the two entrepreneurs have done, mm -hmm. and we want to encourage that, and we want to encourage risk, et cetera, then we also have to make sure that in that process we have a safety net and that we just can't ignore it and pretend that we say, oh, it's a great, it's probably the greatest government program. It's the number one anti-poverty program for the elderly. It's the number one anti-poverty program for children. And people pay into it. It doesn't contribute to the national debt. It's not part of our deficit. It's Congress's inability to take action and do the right thing, including tax cuts for 23 million Americans who have paid into the system and now because it's not enough money for them to survive, so they still get Social Security and work and yet pay taxes on their Social Security. Should that continue? Mr. Irvin? Thank you, Mr. Larson. Um, when you brought up increasing payroll tax, uh, that is directly affecting small business owners like myself, other Main Street employers. Um, Do you get a write-off for that? Well, your portion uh, of Social Security. 
do I get a write-off for my portion of Social Security? Let me ask my accountant real quick. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, um, but no, but seriously, like, pretty good. I, I love Social Security. I need it. We, uh, it's a future program that I hope to benefit from myself and my employees, wow. too. Um, you know, and I know that there's a problem that is space for it, but, you know, my, my hope would be that we'd find another avenue to help fund it uh, rather than coming after the people that are going to be affected the most, which are small businesses like mine. Dr. Edwards, let me go to you. For... Is the question whether or not Social Security benefits should be taxed? Yep. I, I, I think it was a very sneaky addition to the 1983 reform that that was not inflation adjusted so as to hit more Social Security beneficiaries over time without forcing Congress to vote on it and have to look them in the eye and say, we're taxing your benefits for revenue. So I think on principle, it's, it's not Amen. part of our social, it's not worthy to be part of our social security system. That is a system built on compacts with taxpayers, with workers, and with retirees. So something like that just simply doesn't fit. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Winstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. You know, I, I love America. I think America is the place where there's more opportunity than anywhere else in the world. And it's the opportunity for people to come from nowhere and lift themselves out of poverty. But we don't do that by paying people to not work. Mm. That has no return on investment there. And we don't do it by increasing taxes so much that your business moves out of the country and all those employees are without a job. There's no return on investment there. When I see a family succeed in a business and hire people from your community, this is personal now, see? Washington doesn't see it. People that just look at numbers and hold up a piece of paper is different from actually talking to you, which is what we as members of Congress try to do, is get out there and talk to you and what makes a difference. So you do that, you get a better life for your, for your next generation, for your family, but at the end of that, let's put them back in poverty where you started. Why do we want to do that? That makes no sense. Let's keep the business going. Let's keep hiring the next generation of people. You know, rising tide lifts all boats, unless you shoot holes in the bottom of the boat. And that's what I see ourselves doing too many times. Mr. Irvin, I love some of the work that you're doing. Cincinnati, we have Cincinnati Works. You have a record. You decide you're going to turn your life around. You go through the program at Cincinnati Works. You're a lifelong member of it. And we have companies that said when they've gone through that, we will hire them. We have a business called Nehemiah Manufacturing. They make Procter & Gamble products. Everyone there has a record. They've turned their life around. And now they're going to try and make things better for their next generation. You know, in, in, in district, we go around and we say, well, why, why were you able to hire more and to grow your business? What, did, what happened? Did Washington do anything? Or we might also hear, well, why did you have to cut jobs? What happened? These are the things we listen to. We don't just look at things on a piece of paper. But when I think about making America the best place in the world to do business and to work, uh, I, that's what I want us to be. That's what I want us to be. Since the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, we've had zero corporate inversions, and instead we've seen American businesses bringing back their overseas earnings to fuel investment, to increase wage growth here in the United States. Maybe it's not perfect in some ways. Well, let's take a look at that, see what we can make better. That's okay. That's what we should do. Don't just look back and say, oh, it's terrible. It did this, or that. No, it did a lot of good, and people know it. And I hear it from people in the district. I believe, though, as we go forward for the sake of our nation, I'm going to ask Senator Graham about this, I think when the next reform of the tax code needs to be explicitly about our supply chain and take into account our national security risks, our national health security risks, uh, I think it's important. I, I released a draft legislation that would secure our critical battlefield medicines. I'm a soldier. Do this by providing powerful new incentives to locate manufacturing of these essential man medical products here in the United States and in pharmacy, all the active ingredients. We rely on China for that, an adversary. Open up our eyes, folks. We've got to incentivize these things to be back in the United States. And increasing corporate taxes is not how we're going to get it done. No one can take that risk. Senator Graham, you, you test, your testimony, you said how important 2017 reforms were to corporate tax code and making 
country competitive again. This isn't 100 years ago. This isn't post-World War II. This is a different global economy today, and we need to think differently to be competitive. So uh, besides protecting the 21% rate, uh, what policy should Congress pursue as we approach 2025 that will build on that progress and make it more attractive to bring business back to the United States and make us a more secure nation? Well, you raise the point that we don't help America by paying people not to work. Uh, let me back that point up with some statistics. In, 2000, in 1967, when we started to ramp up funding for the war on poverty, we were providing $9,700 worth of benefits to the average household in the bottom 20% of earners and 67% of their prime work age persons worked. That level of benefits has now grown from $9,700 to $45,400. And what did we get for it? The labor force participation rate among prime work age persons in the bottom 20% of income owners in America has fallen from 67% to 36%. During the pandemic, when we provided benefits up to 400% of poverty and we provided basically welfare to middle income Americans, what happened? the labor force participation rate fell. We can't put middle America on welfare. Somebody's got to work. And I, I would have to say, going back to who benefited, the income of the bottom 20% of earners in this country rose by 9.4% in the year following this tax cut in 1997. That was the largest percentage benefit of any sector of the economy. And how did they benefit? This didn't count the child tax credit you provided. They benefited by working. And again, a job is the best program. There's no substitute for it. And many of those people will never go back on welfare. Thank you, you'll be back. Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Irwin, Mr. Ramirez, uh, I'm assuming uh, your, your concern about tax increases uh, does not extend to your responsibility to pay the taxes you owe. I'm assuming that both of you uh, are very careful to make sure that you meet your tax obligations. Yes. That is safe assumption, Mr. Ramirez? Yes, sir. Um, are you concerned about people that you compete against who are not paying their fair share of the taxes? Taxes they owe, does that concern you? Is that a competitive advantage for them if they don't pay their taxes? Yeah, my biggest concern is uh, state subsidized companies in no, China. My, my, my question was, do you suffer a disadvantage if your competitors don't pay their taxes? Yeah, my, my competitors are largely in China, and they get a 200 percent deduction on their R&D expenses, while I get a 20 percent deduction, and that, that's a major disadvantage. I'm talking for us. about you don't have any competitors in the United States. Our primary competitors are in China and Europe. Do you have people you do business with in the United States? I'm sorry, Congressman. Do I have business people I do business with in the United States? No, yes. never mind. I, Mr. Irwin, do you, do you compete with anybody in the United States? Yes. And if they don't pay their taxes and you do, does that pose a competitive disadvantage? Well, of course it would. Okay. <clears throat> okay. I'm, just, I'm just wondering yeah. because we have these fascinating conversations and debate dancing on the head of a pin, competing economists about the, the ins and outs of tax policy and fairness. But as a practical matter, we have $163 billion a year that is not paid by 
the top 1% of American taxpayers. They forget to claim their income. And it's just, it's mystifying oh. to me that uh, we, we don't focus on this tax gap. This is money every single year. And the evidence is the richer people are, the more they forget to claim on their taxes. Maybe they've got so much they can't keep track of it. But the evidence is clear. This tax gap is an ongoing expense every single year. And as we're talking about tax policy going forward, it would seem to me that the easiest area that we should focus on are the taxes that are already due and owing that put people forget to pay. I, I don't want to engage you in that. I just find it's, I think it's interesting that people come in with their concerns about tax fairness and what's going to happen and how we're going to meet the deficit that is growing. And we're not focusing on collecting taxes that are already due and owing. Uh, this tax gap is something that we attempted recently to address. Strengthening the IRS's potential to actually collect taxes that are due and owing. It's interesting, one of the first things that passed from my colleagues on this committee was to take away money for enforcement from wealthy Americans. That was going to end up increasing the deficit $113 billion. I would hope that there would be some concern from the business community or academics or others to make sure that we have a level playing field, that people do what I assume you two do, which is pay the taxes that are due and owing. You can argue policy, but you comply with the tax law. And we have people who simply don't do that and it adds remarkably to the deficit year after year after year. This seems to me to be the simplest adjustment we could make. That's make sure that we collect the taxes that are due and owing and have a level playing field for the remaining people in the business community. Thank you, I yield back. Mr. Arrington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, witnesses, for your time and insights. Special thanks to my friend from Texas, uh, your exceptional service to the great state uh, of Texas. And sir, Chairman Graham, you represent the best of the character and common sense of Texas. So thank you for your, for your years of contribution. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I read her memoirs and that's where I'm, I'm quoting your mother actually. Um, look. We try really hard to simplify the contrast between our philosophy on the role of government in the lives of the citizens of this great country, our fiscal, budgetary, and economic policies versus our Democrat colleagues, and the consequences and the experiences, the results of those two sets of policies derived by these distinct philosophies. And it's not always easy to cut through the smoke and mirrors and sleight of hand, but I think because we had unified Republican leadership and then on the heels of that had unified Democrat leadership, I don't think there's a better picture of the two different philosophies, policies, and results. And TCJA is just one pro-growth uh, policy in the economic agenda of my fellow Republicans. It's deregulation, it's America first trade, it's a number of things. But because of the agenda we advanced when I was a freshman in this institution in 17, we got record investment, record growth, record job, millions of jobs, lowest poverty rates, highest increase in median income in 20 plus years. And the list of successes and achievements just goes on and as my colleague said, all boats rose on the tide of prosperity that was unleashed because of economic freedom, quite frankly. Less government, more freedom, and uh, America was doing much better. Now, contrast that with $6 trillion in 
additional deficit spending. Six trillion added to the national debt, record 40-year inflation, 20-year record interest rate hikes, people spending more $1,400 more to survive in some cases in this country as a result of inflation, people paying twice the amount for a mortgage, twice the amount for their car payment. And Dr. Graham, and I say Dr. Graham because I know you're an, an economist and you were a professor and you taught economics, and let me see if I understand supply and demand with respect to the contrast between the unleashing of prosperity through economic freedom and more government spending, borrowing, taxing, et cetera, and regulation, and what we're living with, with in terms of this cost of living crisis, not the least of which, in terms of concerns, is the slide to a sovereign debt crisis or some related crisis. You've got overstimulated demand through trillions of dollars in federal funds. You've got uh, supply being squeezed by paying people not to work, who are work capable, by regulating the lifeblood of our economy, because if you tax and regulate uh, energy, you get less of it vis-a-vis -vis demand, you're going to pay more for it, and we tax the competitiveness of American job creators. Now, is, is when you do those things, you get a, an imbalance in supply and demand, and you get this inflation tax, which is the worst and most regressive tax. Now, Dr. Graham, grade my paper on that and tell me where I got it right, where I got it wrong, because we've got two different worldviews, two different sets of policies. And by the way, we double down on economic freedom and our path to balancing the budget and beyond. And President Biden, got to respect him, put it all on the table, doubles down on two and a half trillion dollars more in mandatory spending, five trillion dollars more in taxes, the highest level of sustained spending, taxing, and borrowing in the history of the United States of America. Well, uh, let me say that the, the proof is in what happened. For the last 50 years, we have increased social spending. Uh, we have uh, uh, instituted numerous policies, and yet the 2017 tax cuts increased median income twice as much as any other action by any other government in the last 50 years. Now, you can distort the figures by talking about uh, uh, Warren Buffett's tax cut and some person that doesn't pay taxes, but you can't distort that figure. And the biggest beneficiary in percentage terms was the bottom 20% of income earners. And they didn't benefit by going on welfare, they benefited by going to work. And it seems to me that that is the greatest benefit. Uh, I wonder what the world of many people sitting up there would be if we'd had the welfare system when they were growing up that we have today. My guess is a lot of you wouldn't be there. <laughs> expired, thank you. Mr. Mr. Pascro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I can respond to a gentleman I have a great respect for, Senator Graham, as I do each of the witnesses. But you really blew my mind in what you just said. It's been referred to by three of the panelists that what happened in 2017 was tax reform. We haven't had tax reform since the 70s and 80s. And you remember that, Senator Graham. We haven't had it. We haven't had a change in how we look at the tax code itself. Not at all. Because you raise taxes or you decrease taxes does not mean it's reforming the system. Because you can't deny that in the first quarter of this century, in 2024, it looks like in these 25 years, we will have increased the gap between the rich and the poor, 
and that that income gap is something we have not addressed, Republicans or Democrats. And you can't do it until you have tax reform and not just 5% increase in wages. That does not help us reduce the gap. It does not. So gentlemen, I think that this is another tax scam. And I'll be honest, I'm not trying to be a wise guy. The chairman knows I'm gonna say what I think. It's also one of the most destructive laws and from the 116th Congress in generations. My colleagues on the other side said their tax scam would be the best thing since canned beer. That really got my interest up. Let us look at what actually happened. They promised it would raise wages. It did not really raise wages. Many things in affect how wages go up and go down. They vowed it would put America on stronger footing. Instead of blow a grand canyon of debt, nearly $2 trillion, not a nickel of which was paid for. You folks always talk about paying for what you do. This was not paid for. And the people took it out on your hides in 2018 when we overcame a deficit in numbers of people sitting in the House of Representatives, a big deficit. They saw right through it. They said it would let Americans file their taxes on a postcard. Oh, how quickly we forget. They swore it would help middle-class Americans, but nearly all the money went to people who have a lot of money. The cake went to big business, and we know where the crumbs went. They said out loud they did it to screw states like mine. They said it. I was there. I witnessed it. Republicans said that, particularly when you shafted us on the salt plan in those poor 12 states. You know, Lincoln knew what he was doing, but I want to go back at the history. Who cares about that? George Orwell said, to see what is in front of your nose requires constant struggle. I have a big nose, it's constant trouble. That is true when you are told to ignore reality, like here today. Last week, Donald Trump spoke to some members at his golf club and he told them, we gave you the largest tax cuts in history. Here's a guy just a month ago said he wanted to blow up the economy. Is that what the election is worth? 10 seconds, he summarized their entire platform. The other side wants to give big business another giant tax cut. They do not want to pay for it either. I don't see that. Oh, it'll pay for itself because it'll be so great then they want to gut IRS so the same people can cheat on their taxes. They want to cut billions of dollars from what was voted on by the Congress of the United States. So that's what in, is in front of our noses. This scam of 2017 was a failure. And the citizens know more than we do, and they took it out on your hide in 2018 as they would have taken it out of our hide. The GOP tax scam of 2025 is worse. Ms. Edwards, you are familiar with the tax scam of 2017, the tax cuts of 2017. Did the law raise wages, reduce inequity, and help the middle class as was promised? Three things. The wage increases of 2018 were largely due to the economy hitting full employment after recovering from the 2007 to 2009 Great Recession. The law's greatest strength was that it happened at a good time, not that it contributed to those directly. If you want to raise wages for people at the bottom, you can raise the minimum wage. If you rely on an intermediary of their employer, 
you know, they're not going to get the full benefit. Ms. Edwards, can you describe how making the tax scam permanent would harm American society and the middle class? We want to double here. We want to do a voodoo. Mr. Pastro. Capital letters. We're I have her answer the question. Okay. We're a minute and 25 seconds over, but let's do it. The most expensive part of the tax cut is the investments that it didn't make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And it's a wonderful day in the neighborhood again. <laughs> I am so shocked you didn't talk about salt. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, I will recognize myself uh, for some questions right now. Um, when you look at the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act, um, you can't argue that the tax cuts created the best economy in my lifetime. I'm only 43, but I can tell you in the 43 years I've been alive, it's the best economy we ever had. And it was because of the 2017 tax cuts, but also having President Trump leading this country and created the most reduction in regulations any sitting president has ever done. And those two things led to the best economy. In fact, it led to the best poverty rate, the lowest poverty rate dropped in history by recorded numbers. By what we measure poverty is, we had the lowest, lowest rate ever in history. Those are facts. I know facts sometimes hurts and gets people upset up here, but those are facts. I also want to give another fact. I can't accept that as a fact. It, it's documented, documented information. Another fact is this billionaire tax that a lot of people, you know, let's go after the wealthiest of the wealthy. The wealthiest of the wealthy. And guess what? Guess what? If you took every dollar of every billionaire in America, where they don't even have one cent to their name, you could fund government for almost eight months. Fund government for eight months if you took every penny of every billionaire in this world. Mr. Chairman, I am not talking about soaping the rich. I don't agree with Mr. you. Mr. Pascrell, it is my time. Mr. Pascrell, it is my time, and it's okay for you to disagree. Who are you talking about? I'm not talking about you. So I will reclaim my time. Um, Mr. Graham, let's talk about this. Um, in the years that followed enactment of the Trump tax cuts, um, we saw lower income earners have a huge reduction in their taxes. The bottom 20% of earners, those with incomes up to $26,000, saw their federal tax rate fall to its lowest level in 40 years, the lowest level in 40 years. Workers in the lowest 10% of the income saw 50% higher wage growth than those in the highest 10%. The economy, it grew by 1% faster than CBO had projected, and we saw record lows in unemployment, including for those without a high school degree. Why did the Trump tax cuts deliver so much for working families? Because it created an environment in which people invested more money and created more jobs. Now, it's true that rates were down, but what is far more important is the rise in the median income of the bottom two quintiles who were very major beneficiaries of the tax cut and deregulation. And I don't think we advanced debate by simply making up numbers that this tax cut went to billionaires. The, the evidence is so overwhelming. The data. So in uh, regards to that, and when you talk about real wages, um, real wages increased by more than 5% after passage of this, which was the highest in 20 years. It was also more than the prior eight years combined, which is pretty substantial, because since Joe Biden's taken the oath of office as president the last three years, real wages have declined 3.9%. And so that does affect real working class Americans. Dr. Winfrey, um, you were talking about the standard deduction. 
I want to ask you a question about the child tax credit. Um, do you know how the child tax credit affects families in their federal tax rate? Gives tax relief to families. So my calculation shows that a family of four, mm -hmm. a family of four, if they make $64,000 or less, they will pay zero in federal taxes. That's tax relief. I represent one of the poorest congressional districts in the nation. Our median household income's right around $40,000 a year. Right around 40,000. A family of four who makes $40,000 have benefited greatly from the doubling of the child tax credit. It was from 1,000 to 2,000, and that was done with Republicans. Not one Democrat voted for that. Not one. But we gotta move ahead and look at all this tax, the, the taxes for 2025. And the child tax credit is something that we need to be looking at, but we need to make sure that work requirements are in it. The American Rescue Plan child tax credit did not have work requirements in it. And guess what? We saw the results of that in the economy. And so we know that to have a good, workable child tax credit, we need work requirements. With that, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and let me thank all of the witnesses. You know, I'm always amazed at how we can accomplish so much, and yet things remain essentially the same. Amazing. Dr. Edwards, uh, let me thank you for your testimony that clearly lays out the complete failure of the 2017 Republican tax law. It cost $2 trillion with the only real deliverables was growing the bank accounts of the wealthy and well-connected. I really appreciated your focus on the failed opportunity of the Republican law that two trillion could have increased the security of older Americans, dramatically reduced child poverty, ease hunger, help working parents with child care, or paid family and medical leave, or it could have made housing affordable for millions. My Republican colleagues falsely claim that they want the child tax credit to go only to working parents, when in reality, it seems to me that they only want parents who make enough money to owe substantial taxes to benefit. Dr. Edwards, as a labor economist focused on women and security, can you speak about how tax policies that support low-income individuals, parents and workers, strengthen families and boost our economy? For example, if we were to help parents without tax liability get up to $8,000 credit for their child care like we did in 2021, how could that credit help families and the economy? Thank you, sir. The, the senator from Texas misspoke earlier when he talked about the 1996 tax law. That, that was uh, the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act of 1996 ended the cash entitlement for welfare in the United States. We don't have welfare as, as welfare. We have, we have food stamps, but there is no, you know, no strings attached cash that go to the lowest income households, and it has not been the case since I was 10. Um, you know, I, I what, what, what labor economics has taught us over that period in which there has been no cash benefits for low income Americans, including without strings attached, especially for single mothers, you know, what we have learned is that the biggest boost to labor force participation comes from one, a strong economy with low unemployment rate, and two, 
reducing the barriers to work that most workers face. Barriers like not being able to afford childcare. Barriers like you have a felony on your, on your record and so no one will, will hire you. Barriers like you have a disability and you need to get to your job, but you're one of the quarter of Americans that doesn't have paid sick days and so the first time you go to rehabilitation, you get fired. I mean, there are basic structures that we do not have for labor force participation, and it is the number one barrier to having more workers in the United States. Child care for women is right at the top. Families who currently purchase child care, those that choose to do so, pay a quarter of their take-home income to child care benefits. That is more than mortgages in almost every state. And let me quickly ask you, you've done serious work on racial wealth disparities. Would you say that extension of the 2017 Republican tax law would help address racial wealth disparities? No, there, there's the, the racial divide gets larger the higher up the wealth distribution you get. So I, you know, I could see something like the, the pass-through deduction, talking about small businesses and being directed directed towards businesses of color, but it's very important to remember, all small businesses are pass-throughs, not all pass-throughs are small businesses. You know, nearly 70% of people who benefit from pass-throughs are in the top 1% of the income distribution. That's not to say small businesses don't benefit, but they're, they're the minority beneficiary relative to the other people who claim it. So when I say what do you intend to do and what do you actually do, helping small businesses is great. You don't need to hit the top 1% on the way. If you have effectively designed tax relief, it doesn't have to kind of like miss on that, that margin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the witnesses for being here. I first just want to, my, my dear friend from New Jersey and mayor down there, who we have a wonderful relationship, I believe you have gone from drinking that canned beer that you were so excited about to partaking of the devil's lettuce with your rant. That was quite epic, and you were really far out there on a lot of these topics. So um, that was one of the better ones that, that, we've, that we've experienced. So. But with that being said, again, let me thank each of you for being here. A um, couple of questions. Uh, Senator Graham, I believe you said that um, following the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, families received, I think it was you that said this, received about a $5,200 increase in, in salary. Is that? $5,220 on average. Okay. Um, if you look at what inflation has done to American families, they've lost every single bit of that, haven't they? Well, they've lost part of it yeah. uh, since uh, President Biden took office. Again, you know, we can talk all you want to, and you certainly have the right to your own opinions, but you don't have the right to your own facts. The, fa the hardcore facts are that lower-income families were huge beneficiaries of this tax cut. Black Americans saw their income on a household level grow faster than any other year in over 50 years. Now, that's a fact. The census data, and I've got it right here, shows it. So you can say it didn't happen all you want to say, but what we're doing is just simply talking past each other. So um, if, I could, if I could reclaim, and thank you for that, yes, because it I'm is sorry. important when, when we look at what is the most important thing that should come from, from the tax code? It is really economic growth and economic development and creating jobs. Mr. Ramirez, how, how many people, how many new people have you hired since 2017? Oh gosh, Congressman, th thank you for the question. I don't know the exact number, probably 200, 250 people. So it's 250 people, 250 families that have benefited from your your investment, your risk, your hard work, and also the fact that you're that you have more in your pocket to 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 expand and grow your business. Yes, sir. Okay, Mr. Irvin, what, Irvin, when when you started your coffee company, okay, you said you started it as a hobby in your backyard, and now or, or in your garage, I should say. In the garage. In the garage. Um, you you now have say it again, twelve employees. I have 12 employees that we currently have. We've hired more than that over the years. So. Again, 
families and individuals that are that, that have a job with you that otherwise would not have have those jobs exactly right um, looking ahead, look, looking further down the line uh, dr winfrey talk about how important it is with the tax cuts and jobs act when we created the, the, the environment for research and development, not only to invent new products, improve on existing products, but then for businesses to be able to make the strategic capital investments to turn those ideas into products, sell them, and, and make a profit. How important is that to the American economy? Thanks for that question. All of our progress over the last 250 years is a derivative of three things. Uh, one is culture. We have an extremely innovative culture, and we should not be doing things to penalize that. To our institutions, things like property rights. I can't believe I have to say this in 2024, but it seems like at the local level all the way up, and you can talk about Chinese stealing IP and things like this, or you can talk about how property rights have to be defended in cities and towns in America. Property rights are absolutely critical. And the third piece of that pie is technology, right? We should be promoting investments in technology. And when you get all of those three things together, you get prosperity. Okay. Uh, final question. Uh, this, will, this will be a final couple of questions here. Um, how many of you on the panel have, have borrowed money and put yourself at risk to either expand or start a business? Show of hands. Okay. Um, how many of you have signed paychecks? Okay. Um, I tend to trust that. You know how to run a business. You know how, what it takes. You've had to lay awake at night worrying about how to, how to actually get from point A to point B in this process, and you have found a way through it. And for you to say that it makes a difference in the success of your business and your ability to make other families better, I'm going to trust y'all's judgment on this. So thank you so much for being here. Mr. LaHood is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, all of our witnesses for your valuable testimony here today. Um, make no mistake about it, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act um, jump-started an economic boom in this country uh, pre-COVID across so many sectors that have been alluded to today and many of you have talked about, providing businesses with the means to invest more, raising wages, expanding their workforce. We moved almost six million people out of poverty uh, during this period of time directly related to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And, and providing thoughtful tax incentives aimed at keeping more money in the hands of our workers and businesses can go a long way for our communities and our economy. And I saw that in my district in, in Illinois. And TCAJA obviously serves as a great uh, model uh, and a starting point to do just that as we head into the rest of this year and going into next year. And in order to achieve those goals, we're going to ha <clears throat> have to both protect much of what we did seven years ago and also consider new policy proposals based on the world we live in today and our competition. And I look forward to working with my colleagues in this room to further promote U.S. business investment, address the affordable housing crisis, and economic development needs through tools like the Low Income Housing Tax Credit and support for our farms and ranches and continuing to allow citizens at the lower level of our economy to live the American dream, which we expanded that American dream with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Um, one area, Dr. Winfrey, that I wanted to talk to you about, as we built up to TCJA in 2017, we talked a lot about how do we, on the international level, uh, allow our companies and businesses to be more competitive and so uh, we worked on what was the appropriate corporate tax level, but also how do we repatriate money back to the United States? And for too long, many of our companies and corporations were parking money overseas because of the, uh, because of the tax code we had here and the restrictive measures we had in place that disincentivized having that money in the United States. And so we did that. And I'm wondering if you can talk about post-Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, that repatriation that's come back, and where that money has gone. That's right. I mean, that money has, has come back, and it's gone back to Treasury. I think that one of the things that, that you, know, you, meant, you, you highlighted here is that there was a lot of conversation around what that corporate tax rate needed to be in order to be competitive. And it's important to note that the corporate tax rate is not expiring at the end of next year. At the same time, we should still be thinking about what that tax rate should be in order to make it competitive. And uh, to, that, to that 
point when you add the 21% corporate tax rate alongside the state corporate tax rate in most states, you've got a combined tax rate at the federal and the state level that's higher than the corporate tax rate that is applied to companies in China. And if China is a national security threat and an economic threat, then we need to be thinking about how all of that relates back to how we are uh, making businesses like these guys, and in particular, Mr. Ramirez, more competitive, and, uh, uh, and yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, Senator Graham, uh, it's estimated we repatriated about $3 trillion back to the United States because of what we did there. I'm wondering if you could comment on that, that reinvestment in the United States by companies here. And then number two, as we think about how do we win the strategic competition against the CCP, the Communist Chinese Party, um, what we need to be doing from an economic standpoint to make sure we win that strategic competition? Well, first of all, don't imitate China. Don't implement industrial policy here where you assume government knows more about investment than people who are investing their own money. I, I've been stunned at the bipartisan support for trying to compete with China by doing what China does. You want to compete with China, reduce regulatory burden. You want to compete with China, reduce the tax rate. You want to compete with China, deal with the explosion of programs that disincentivize people to work. Look, I'm for tax credits. I want to make it possible for low-income people to benefit from working. But when you're giving tax credits to people that don't work, mm -hmm. you're extending this whole welfare system into the middle class, and it's devastating to America's competitiveness, and we need to be worried about it. So I wouldn't give any tax credit to anybody who is not paying taxes. Just, it's a simple principle. Taxes are about taxpayers. You don't pay taxes, you don't give tax credits. You want to give people welfare, fund it. The biggest dispenser of welfare in America today is the Internal Revenue Service. Now, how did we possibly allow that to happen? That ought to be reversed wholesale, in my opinion. You want to start reforming, that is a very important reform. There Thank are not you, many people in China that are getting paid not to work. I can assure you of that. Well said. Thank you. Ms. Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's astonishing that today Republicans are attempting to resurrect Trump's signature tax bill that rewarded our nation's wealthiest families at the expense of our nation's working families. For decades now, Republican tax policy has reinforced a tax system that's very imbalanced, that favors the richest Americans and the largest corporations. In the six years since Trump signed the bill into law, its tax cuts have proven to be costly and ineffective. Republicans claim that the TCJ's windfall tax cuts to high-earning households and large corporations pay for themselves through economic growth, yet they've never paid for their tax giveaways to the wealthy. Doubling down on the Tax Cuts and Job Act would allow mega corporations to continue paying less in taxes than ever before. And they claim that those you, tax cuts are going to trickle down to everyone else. We know that they don't. But slashing the corporate income rate only lined the pockets of executives and shareholders. It didn't trickle down to workers and families because Republicans seem to be allergic to tax benefits for those who really are deserving of a break. I believe it's time to chart a new and fairer path in tax policy because we know that investments in infrastructure, child care in particular, men on the panel, child care for working parents, child care, um, and ed investments in education are what create great conditions for economic growth. My Democratic colleagues and I recognize that investments that directly benefit American families yield much stronger results than using intermediaries, as Dr. Edwards said earlier. Now, TCJA promised us rainbows and unicorns. They, it promised things were going to be so great and that the tax code was going to be so simple that we could file our tax returns 
on a postcard. I want to ask the panelists by show of hands, how many of you file your income tax returns on a postcard? How many of you earn $50,000 a year or under? $100,000 a year or under? $200,000 a year or under? All right, my question is, why don't we have low-income taxpayers on the panel today to talk about how the TCJA affected them and whether or not it provided all these glorious benefits that my colleagues continue to insist happen when the facts show that they didn't happen. If you look at the Joint Tax Committee's analysis of whether or not the lowest income earners got any benefit at all. Now, Professor Edward, Fans of the Tax Cuts and Job Acts claim, again, these great claims, that the laws passed through deductions strengthen Main Street and small businesses. Can you tell us what kind of taxpayers are taking advantage of that huge deduction? The benefits are concentrated amongst the top 1% of filers by income. So taxpayers across the income spectrum have not benefited equally, isn't that true? Not equally, no. Okay, and if not, does the pass-through deduction drive enough economic growth to outweigh the cost? No. No. Thank you. Professor Edwards, your testimony outlined the 2017 tax law's failure to increase wages for the bottom 90% of workers, none of whom are on the dais today. So what benefits, if any, have low- to middle-income taxpayers seen in the six years since Trump signed the signature tax cuts into law? You know, um, Mr. Graham has said several times about people who don't work not paying their fair share. You know, you can't pass a $2 trillion tax cut that's concentrated at the bottom because they don't pay that much in taxes. If you're paying $2 trillion to lower your tax revenue, it's not going to the poorest Americans because they don't pay that much. So it, it's, it's a, it's, I think kind of just a basic logical argument of if you're going to spend that much in revenue, it's, it's not going to go to the bottom because they don't have that much of a tax burden. It's going to go to the top. It doesn't cost that much to cut people's taxes if they only make $35,000 a year. It costs a lot to cut someone's taxes if they make $35 million a year. That's what drives up the cost of the legislation. Thank you. And as the IRS has shown, the people who are most likely to not pay their fair share of taxes are wealthy individuals and uh, large corporations. Um, Dr. Edwards, can you expand on what you call the opportunity cost of extending the 2017's uh, tax cuts for large corporations and highest income earners instead of making investments in working families? And working families who were paying a quarter of their income for child care would you know, probably be upset to learn that the cost of the 2017 tax cut was enough to create a universal child care and preschool system in the U.S. Uh, at least four, if not five times over. Thank you. And I just want to add, finally, before I yield back my time, that Senator Graham, I take personal issue with your assertion that if a welfare state had been in effect when we were growing up, that there, many of us on the dais would not be here. I would submit to you, number one, we are not a welfare state, but number two, I wonder if we didn't allow family wealth to be passed down, down tax-free to the tune of $13 million per individual or $27 million for married couple, how many members of Congress would be sitting on this dais or would not be here? And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Estes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses today. Uh, you know, it's really unfortunate the amount of misinformation that's out there about uh, uh, that's trying to mislead the American family and American families and, and the people across America about the effects of the TCGA. If we look at the facts and the data, the TCGA allowed more Americans to keep more of their hard-earned dollars, while Treasury ended up collecting more in revenues. A year before TCGA, in January of 2017, CBO projected FY23 revenues would be $5.346 trillion. After passage of TCGA, CBO revised their estimate and estimated that the revenues would only be about $4.182 trillion, or a reduction in revenues by about $174 billion. In reality, the FY23 revenues totaled $4.439 trillion, as we can see in this chart, exceeding even CBO's initial estimates before they factored in TCJA. And this is only the most recent year. If you go back FY22, the numbers were bigger. FY21, they also had bigger numbers. 
Uh, and while these tremendous results are still working to correct the, the, the record, uh, we're trying to correct the record regarding CBO's wildly inaccurate projections and correcting the lingering misinformation about the impact of TCGA, which is more important than ever as we prepare to renew, extend, and strengthen the best, aspect, the best aspects of the TCGA in 2025. Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was massively successful due to the focus on promoting economic growth and U.S. global competitiveness. Prior to TCGA, the U.S. had the highest statutory corporate rate among developed countries. We also had a worldwide tax system that incentivized com companies to hold large cash reserves overseas. By lowering the corporate rate to 21 percent and reforming our international tax system, specifically using the guilty and, and fitty provision, uh, provisions, we were able to bring jobs back, bring intellectual property back to the United States, and tax revenue. After more than five years, we can confidently say the system worked. Corporate tax revenues have increased, even at a lower rate, and there has not been a single U.S. corporate inversion in that same time frame. As we look towards 2025, it's essential that we find ways to build upon these and other successes. One key pro-growth provision that was, uh, must be addressed in 2025 is immediate R&D expensing. Since amortization took effect, the growth rate of R&D spending has slowed dramatically from a 6.6 percent on average increase per year uh, over the previous five years to less than one half of one percent over the last 12 months. Mr. Ramirez, uh, lagging R&D growth is uh, detrimental to our global competitiveness. As someone who's led an international engineering and, ma and manufacturing firm, how does R&D uh, amortization impact our ability to compete in the world? Congressman, thank you for the question. I, I think this is the single most important issue uh, in the tax reform right now. I mentioned earlier, China has a 200 percent super deduction for R&D. My biggest competitors in China, and, and now since 2022, I get a 20 percent reduction uh, deduction for R&D. I've got to amortize it over five years. Since 2022, that one policy has created a $20 million hole in my balance sheet. I have $20 million less liquidity because I have to amortize R&D and if I could just expense 100 percent of it in the year incurred, that's a massive drag on our ability to invest and create new products and, and deploy new capital and grow our business. Yep. And as I mentioned, we're seeing a reduction in R&D expenditures. We're also seeing a reduction in jobs in research and development because of that. Uh, Senator Graham, uh, I appreciate you being here today, uh, so much that you've covered. Uh, you talked earlier a little bit about international tax and, and particularly the Pillar 2 provision. I've been a staunch opponent of the approach that was taken to look through that. I, I want to give you some more time to just talk about some of the concerns that you have about that. I think it's just detrimental, and, and I think uh, whatever you can add to the conversation would be great uh, to help with uh, clar clarifying that. Well, again, I think you don't have to give Americans an advantage you just need to give us a playing field that's flat as compared to our competitors. Um, I think that the 2017 tax reduction was very effective because it moved us from the highest corporate tax rate in the world into a competitive range. American, uh, the American economy works better because we're, we have greater ability of people to make decisions. The system is more flexible, more adjustable. That is changing now with a regulatory burden. I can honestly say as someone who engages in business in the United States and in Europe, there is no socialist government in power in Europe that has uh, a regulatory burden that is growing at anything like the regulatory burden in the United States. And, and as we see, uh, that, that just and, so and devastating. And it's very, very harmful. Yep. Um, and the point being is that it costs jobs, growth, and opportunity. And it, in the process, it's not going to make me poor, but many of the people that are having great concerns expressed on their behalf are going to be poorer as a result of it. Thank you, and I appreciate your time. I yield back. Mr. Smucker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Caught me by surprise there. 
first of all, thanks for um, holding today's official kickoff for our discussions uh, surrounding the tax reform uh, that we'll be needing to do in 2025. And I just want to expand on what uh, Mr. Estes uh, just said, that chart I thought really said the story well. But TCGA, it broke records on uh, raising millions of families out of poverty. It boosted median income across all demographics. It created millions of jobs. It unleashed economic growth. But it also made the tax code fairer, not less fair. Thanks to the reforms made uh, on, the in, it, on the individual side of the taxes, our tax code is now among the most progressive in the world. According to CBO, higher income earners started paying more in income taxes post TCJA. In fact, individual income tax collection increased by 27.5% overall income tax collection, with 80% of that being paid by the top 10% of earners. 27% uh, increase in total revenues coming in, 80% of that came from the top 10%. Corporate tax revenues also went up even during the pandemic. In fact, receipts had double-digit annual increases, which had only happened 11 times since uh, 1977. And Mr. Chairman, I do have an article from Politico uh, uh, that I'd like to submit into the record. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, that was all achieved because the TCA, it was just flat out, it was good tax policy. Uh, by targeting reforms to the co code, we closed loopholes, we helped low- and middle-income Americans keep more of their hard-earned money, and we spurred record business investment to grow uh, our GDP. Uh, and I, I just want to contrast that with some of the tax policies, what I think are bad tax policies that we've seen coming from this administration. It's important we, we talk about this uh, going into 2025. Last year, my Democrat colleagues passed the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, which President Biden repeatedly claimed would raise taxes on the wealthy and corporations and make them pay their fair share. Now, I still haven't ever had anyone define to me what a fair share is. We keep hearing that brought up, and I don't know what the fair share is of, of, of someone who's earned uh, and worked hard for that money. What is the fair share they should be paying? I don't know the answer to that. But what we've seen is even though President Biden claims that he in increased taxes on the wealthy and on corporations, the data actually shows, and I'll have another article, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit uh, for the record from the New York Times. Without objection. And this goes to Senator Graham's uh, conversation about industrial policy. The data shows that he's actually cut taxes for corporations and high income earners through corporate tax breaks for his favorite industries. He talks about raising taxes, but he's actually benefited and cut taxes for uh, his favorite industries. And by the way, he also hasn't kept true to his claim that the IRS won't audit households making less than 400,000. IRS data shows that as of last summer, 63% of new audits targeting taxpayers uh, are targeting taxpayers with income of less than 200,000. That's, that's according to a, a report just out from the IRS. So now what we're left with is small businesses in my district who can't take advantage of those cherry-picked corporate taxes now face an audit-heavy uh, environment. And really one of the best benefits that they have received from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is the 199A deduction for uh, small businesses. And Mr. Irwin, I very much appreciate you bringing that up. I'm, I'm pleased to be the lead sponsor of, of extending that provision, making that uh, provision uh, important, uh, because Main Street businesses that employ 60% of all private sector employees, uh, they'll face a, 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 a dramatic increase in taxes if we do away with 199A. 43.4% uh, 43 federal tax rate will be the top tax rate for them. Re raising their tax it would result, could result in reduced wages, reduced benefits for workers, certainly reduced investment in the business, uh, and other uh, impacts to our growth. So again, Mr. Irvin, I know you mentioned this, but could you expand on um, how a 43.4% tax rate would potentially uh, impact your business if we do not make 199A permanent? 
simply put, ultimately, a close sign would go up in my window. And not only in my window, but on the windows of most of the other businesses on my street if we had to pay that. So hopefully that simplifies it. Thank you. I have other questions, but I see I'm already out of time. But the chairman's not paying attention, so we'll keep going. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Ms. Sewell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, there are distinct populations within this nation that did not Tried benefit it. from the enactment of the TCJA yeah. uh, in 2017. I can tell you right now that the hardworking Americans in my district, Alabama's 7th Congressional District, were not beneficiaries of this legislation. If we're going to spend the afternoon discussing the work of this committee and the work that we've done to aid hardworking Americans, let's look back to 2020 instead of 2017. It was only the action of Democrats in the height of the COVID-19 that provided common sense solutions, like making the child tax credit fully refundable, that addressed the needs of hardworking Americans, who at no fault of their own were being hit in the hardest pandemic once in a generation pandemic. But here we are, we're talking about 2017. And if we're to talk about 2017, let's be honest about the cost of the TCJA. Two trillion dollars, two trillion dollars. I was in the room uh, in 2017 when the TCJA was re repealed the advanced refunding on tax exempt municipal bonds. Now, I was a bond lawyer. Uh, Ms. Edwards, you talked about the opportunity cost, what we could have done with the $2 trillion. And I can tell you that a lot of the underserved, vulnerable communities that I represent, a lot of the towns and villages and small communities, really did use tax-exempt bonds to uh, try to uh, revitalize their, uh, their downtown area. It actually you know, did hire people and the like. But the reality is that we chose to repeal advance refunding of uh, tax bonds and at a time when we saw economic growth. My question to you is this. The benefits that the TCJA had are not necessarily attributable to the TCJA. Can you talk a little bit more about that? and also about the opportunity costs. I mean, you talked about how we could have paid for childcare. Um, I also know that, uh, that $2 trillion could have gone a long way to helping us with the child tax credit, and which did lift out, uh, lift millions of uh, Americans out, especially children, out of poverty. Sure, so the, yeah, there, there, there's a lot of numbers going around. Was TCGA a benefit to the top? Was it a benefit to the bottom? You know, where I base my assessment is based on the Congressional Budget Office projections. So here's how this works. You've got a bunch of marginal tax rates and tax laws. You change them and then they go into, they go into effect. What, why we think it benefited the top is because if you didn't look at anything that had happened, but who got the difference of the tax rates, where the tax laws were changed, that was at the top. Now, a lot happened in the economy since 2017 that would make the actual tax receipts of the government vary based on economic activity. So, you know, yes, the top is paying more because they're earning more. You know, that's the the kind of attributing causal, you know, or attributing the cause to the tax cut happens basically when it is enacted of what the differences in the rates are as opposed to how the economy evolves. So here's- But, but, but Ms. Edwards, I mean, people are saying that black households increase the highest it's ever increased because of the TCJA. And I can tell you that the black households that I represent in Alabama, it didn't trickle down to them. So can you talk to us a little bit about why it is that there was benefits? No one's saying there wasn't benefits, it's who benefited. Yes, exactly. The, the, you know, the, the pass-through deduction is a great example of, it, you know, it did benefit some small businesses, but 67% of the beneficiaries are in the top 1%. And it's, it's not just, did you create some beneficiaries that you like, but did you create some beneficiaries that you didn't intend to? You know, I, I, I kept hearing about, I, I mean, I keep hearing about how much wages have gone up, how much income has gone up. 
Child labor has gone up in this country 250% since 2017. And no one would say that's because of the tax law. But if I said, look, they had lower tax rates, they had lower regulation, you know, did that lead to child labor? It took off at the same time. You would say, no, that's the economy, that's immigration, that's other things happening. So when I say you're, you're claiming wage increases, you know, you'd have, to take, you'd have to take child labor along with it, sir. They happen at the same time. They don't happen for the causal reason. Sounds like we use these facts and figures to, to serve our own purposes. Um, but what's a fact Certainly. to me, Mr. Chairman, is that my, my district in Alabama did not benefit from the TCJA, and I will not be seeking to um, extend those uh, cuts. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Hearn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It always amazes me that people never created a single job and know more about business than those who have spent their entire life doing so. Um, in 2017, Congress lowered the corporate tax rate from 35%, which at the time was the highest tax rate in the OECD. And they, that, that lowered tax rate went down to 21%. Adding state corporate tax taxes now, the average combined U.S. corporate tax rate is now 25%, which is just above the global mean of 23%, lowering the corporate rate almost to the global mean, made American businesses and millions of American workers more competitive in the global marketplace. It was apparent back in 2017, as much as it is today, that the U.S. needs a corporate rate that is competitive with the rest of the world. U.S. multinationals were fleeing the United States, and headlines of corporate inversions were commonplace, taking their jobs and capital investment with them as they left. Nobody's disputed that fact. Lowering the corporate rate combined with international tax provisions stopped inversions, encouraged domestic investment, and made the U.S. an attractive place to do business and create jobs for American workers. Total U.S. domestic investment grew by over 20 percent after GOP tax reform, and year over year, we continue to see rep record corporate tax receipts. Tax reform is working. Jobs and innovation are coming back home. We should look to build on these gains as we approach the massive tax cliff coming at the end of 25. Unfortunately, the Biden administration has proposed massive corporate tax hikes that are out of sync with the rest of the world, has proposed a repeal of the vital TCGA international tax provision, foreign derived intangible income, or otherwise known as FITI, which play a critical role in bringing intellectual property back to the United States and keeping it here to begin with. The Biden administration has also unilaterally committed the United States to a global tax policy that could diminish the United States' competitiveness on a global scale and have grave consequences for our domestic economy. I've said this time and time again, progress on the new global tax agreements is important, but Congress must approve any commitments that might erode the U.S. revenue base or significantly impact bilateral trade and investment flows. Congressional action to carry out international tax agreements is clear from the text and structure of the Constitution. Mr. Chairman, I would like to enter into the record the Wall Street Journal op-ed, How Congress Can Stop Biden's Regulatory Onslaught. Did you say a Wall Street Journal op-ed? I did. Okay. Okay. I know it's controversial. Senator Graham, thanks for all your work that you did in the Senate and so many that you, so many op-eds you've written, I've, I've followed them all. Your Wall Street Journal, Journal op-ed is quoted saying, remarkably, the Biden administration agreed to let foreign governments tax U.S. companies on their U.S. earnings if Congress refuses to adopt the minimum tax. Is this extraordinary circumvention of the Constitution the Biden administration has attempted to use in an international agreement that Congress never approved to force Congress to raise taxes? How harmful would it be for not only our economy, but our democracy, if Congress's hands were ever forced to rubber stamp Biden's poorly negotiated global minimum tax? Well, first of all, there was no advice and consent given to Congress in any of the negotiations with the OECD countries concerning the uh, international minimum corporate rate. Number two, no treaty was ever passed. Uh, no law has ever implemented the minimum tax. But what President Biden has agreed to is to stand by and allow European countries to tax American subsidiaries in their country on income the subsidiary made in the United States if we don't impose the corporate minimum tax in the United States. 
And if I could urge this committee to do one thing, it would be to pass a bill that mandates retaliation against any country that implements a tax against American companies to, in essence, tax their American earnings. It, 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 with all of this talk about assaults on the Constitution, this is the greatest assault on the Constitution in my lifetime. And I, if, if Biden were a Republican and I were in the Senate, uh, there would be no peace until we'd stop this thing. Senator, this has nothing to do with partisanship. Thank, thank you so much for your testimony. Yeah, I'm thank sorry. You for, I, no, I, no, thank you for being here. Uh, I have a tendency as a senator to just go on. <laughs> well, you have, have no time limit over there. Uh, I just want to put for the record that I'm a proud co-sponsor of Congressman Smucker's uh, Main Street Tax Certainty Act. Uh, I think that if we don't make sure that our small businesses in America uh, are taxed favorably so that they can create jobs, grow, and keep this economy going into the future. I always say for the record, there's not a single business in America that didn't start as a small business, and we need to recognize that. I yield back. Ms. Miller is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And a special thank you to you, Senator Graham, for spending the afternoon with us, your precious time. And to all of you witnesses for being here, uh, but I especially want to welcome a fellow West Virginian, Michael Irvin of Coal River Coffee Company in St. Albans, which is in my district, for making the trip to Washington and getting an earful of how we do business here. It's entirely different. Um, it's just so good to hear voices of business owners from my home state to discuss the benefits of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and our committee's work to extend the key benefits for hardworking Americans, like Mr. Irvin, and his employees. You all are what make the country great. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is one of the most important policies passed into law in generations. And thanks to the work of President Trump and the united Republican governance in the House and Senate. To this day, the positive impacts of a simpler tax code are still being felt and it is telling that Biden and his liberal colleagues in the House and Senate did not repeal any key provision of President Trump's landmark legislation and failed to gain the requisite support within their own party to raise our tax rate or strip small businesses of their fairer treatment that the TCJA did provide. Lowering our corporate tax rate to a globally competitive 21% has been a key driver in drawing investment to our country and allowing our businesses to reinvest in their employees and communities. And I strongly support maintaining this rate. Any increase to pay for industry-specific handouts undermines the core tenet of the TCJA of broadening our tax base and simplifying the tax code. The Tax Cut and Jobs Act was extremely successful at simplifying the code on the individual side as well. In West Virginia, over 97% of filers utilize the increased standard deduction included in the TCJA. This means that more families spend less time worrying about their taxes and have more in their pockets at the end of the day. Families, large employers, and small businesses all benefited from the passage of the TCJA. And in West Virginia, only 98% of our businesses are actually small businesses. The 199A, a small business deduction, allows for pass-through entities to receive a comparable tax rate to larger corporations, allowing small businesses to stay competitive and reinvest in their employees. And I look forward to working with a re-elected President Trump, Chairman Smith, and all my colleagues to extend the essential component of the TCJA and spend the next year hearing from our constituents on how to improve on this essential legislation. Mr. Irvin, can you describe what the impact on Coal River Coffee would be if 199A deduction was not extended? Absolutely. Um, let me just start off by saying we've only existed since this has existed. When I started my company, I probably was considered low income. 
<laughs> and to, to answer Ms. Sanchez's question earlier. Um, so yes, I'm qualified to answer and speak to these aspects. And it, uh, it created an environment for entrepreneurship in a very depressed and economically depressed state. And um, if we lose that uh, deduction in particular, it will squelch, it'll kill that environment. Not only that, um, there won't be as much of an incentive to actually start something and take a risk, maybe take a loan and do the things that are necessary to create economy. And that's what we're doing is creating economy, creating jobs, doing what the American dream is. And just like my friend over here, you know, his father started their, their journey in this dream. And that's what I'm doing, hopefully, for my children who are sitting in the back of this right now watching this. They can inherit my business someday. And if this deduction is not extended or made permanent, which is what I hope, then me and the other entrepreneurs, business owners, 98% of the businesses in my state might have to close. Well, and that's me, why I'm here today. Tell me quickly how you have reinvested in your community. Yeah, very quickly, um, we help start organizations. We help, uh, we give money toward our Little League programs in particular. And are these bigger corporations doing that? No, they're not. We give to almost every sporting um, team that comes to us. And uh, we obviously have our program with the Recovery Network. Uh, we help with organizations that um, integrate folks with disabilities. We employ folks with disabilities uh, to, and, and they love being a part of something that is bigger because well, for, go ahead. I was just going to say that is how small town America works. And I exactly. do have to yield back my time. I'm sure. so sorry. And Thank Mr. You. Ramirez, I had questions for you too, but we talked too long. Thank you for being here, all of you. Thank you. Now I recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Dr. Murphy. Did I scare the Democratic witness away? Must have. Anyway, um, I, thank you all for coming today. You know, it, it appoints to me that uh, our, our Democratic colleagues love to attack the big, nasty, big corporations when 98% of our corporations in this country have 100 employees or less. And uh, what uh, Representative Hearn said, that every company starts as a small company, is absolutely true. You know, a couple of statistics here, the, DC, the TCGA for minority groups hit all-time uh, income, hit all-time highs. Compared to the second term of Obama and Biden, wages grew 24% faster Hispanic, 79% for African Americans, 95% for Asian Americans. This is what happens when you unleash the power of the American economy. Um, thank you for coming back, sorry about that. I didn't, I didn't say anything bad, I promise. Um, I just, I just want to reiterate that most of the corporations in this country are small employees. They're not the big bad things that do things. And so when we cut the corporate tax rate, we're hurting our small things. Um, Dr. Dr. Edwards, let me ask you just a couple quick questions. We're talking about the not fair share when the rich are not paying their fair share. So they pay 47%, the top 1%. What percent would you think is appropriate for them to pay? Y'all, I don't decide fair. Well, no, I mean, that's what we hear all the time. Pay their fair share, pay their fair share. And when what, the top 1% pay 47% of the tax burden, I want to know what, what would, would a Democrat witness say is the fair share? Well, speaking as an economist uh, and not as a Democrat, what I would say, sir, is that the top 1% have also seen the accumulations of income over the past 20 years. Part of their outsized burden of how much they're paying in taxes is also a fact of how much faster their income has grown over the past 40 years. And the top 1% income share is now at a 70-year high. It's not just the rate that sets the share, but also the total amount of income they earn relative to the economy. Yeah, I, and I would, I, I, you know, I'm not going to disagree. Their facts are always your facts and my facts, and that's just the way life happens. Um, to what Senator Graham said earlier about um, we want, to, we want a child tax credit. We want to lift up the poor. We absolutely do. The problem is in the state of North Carolina now, 52% of the births in the state of North Carolina are born to mothers on Medicaid, over half. So think about that geometry. Think about those proportions as we move forward. 
What does that look like? I still see patients, I still see them to this day, who, uh, whose mother I saw as a young patient, and it's grandmothers now raising children, and it is generational Medicaid because there's no expectation when you have a child that you have to pay for it. There's none, and this is the destruction of the American dream right there. Senator Graham, I, I wanna follow up. You know, the pandemic was horrible for the world, started in China, we all know that. But one of the, we did find some few silver linings. We saw our absolute and utter dependency upon China. I would love for you to comment on how, you were talking about how much regulation is killing American businesses. I, I would love for you to comment on what you thought is happening to United States competitiveness on the national scale due to overregulation now is doing to our national security. We saw how national security is threatened now because if we were at a war with China, we'd have two months worth of medicines. How is this a threat to national security? Well, the security of the United States, when you get down to the bottom line, comes from the productivity of the American worker. It gives us the ability to not only provide the resources for defense, but it gives us the technology to always be out front. Uh, Technology for defense is now coming from the private sector. That wasn't true when I came to Congress. It was coming from the industrial military complex when I came here. But now it's out in the general domain. So the only way we can stay ahead is by developing the technology ourselves. Right, and by We've got to be first our American bit. I'm going to make sure I get in, but. Uh, Regulatory burden strangles our ability to do that. Now, perfect example is artificial intelligence. Uh, President Clinton set out a policy when the internet came on the American scene of first do no harm. You've heard that phrase Absolutely. in your profession. And we stayed out of regulating the internet and we dominated it. We absolutely dominate the tech industry. So what has the Biden administration done in response to artificial intelligence? They're demanding all kinds of uh, actions by artificial intelligence to deal with everything in the world except artificial intelligence. And my concern is if we don't develop the technology, somebody else will. And will the world come to an end? Maybe not, but we'll be poor, we'll be less dominant in terms of our ability to defend ourselves, and even if the lion, lion and the lamb in the world lie down together, we better be the lion. And so I'm concerned about it. Also, an important point was made that Biden has cut corporate taxes more than that corporate taxes have been cut under the Biden administration, and they have. But they've been cut for industries government picked. So a perfect example is we're providing all these tax Senator credits. Senator I may need to, I need to Let me finish this one point, if I may, please. We provided all these tax credits to make computer chips. And so the largest manufacturer of computer chips in the world in Taiwan says, with all of these subsidies, we'll be able to make these computer chips in America, and they'll only be 50% more expensive than the computer chips right. you can buy from Taiwan. Well, what kind of great deal is that? Thank you, Senator. I guess my time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. Now I uh, yield myself uh, five minutes. Um, I know a little bit about economics. I'm going to taught a class or two in it. Uh, I do know this about economics, that you can always argue a picture uh, that you want to portray. All right? If you want to portray something, you, you, you argue it. You spend the numbers. All right? It happens. In economics, that's the, the great thing about the field. You can always argue something. But sometimes facts are, are getting in the way, getting in the way. And I, I just want to talk about a few facts. So under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Acts, we had a tax code before Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Before, you know, we were at, our corporate rate was at 35%. So between 1983 and 2015, we had 60 companies that inverted and moved their headquarters to another country. And this trend, 
trend was continuing on until the Ta Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. After that, after that, we've had zero, zero inversions. Think about that, zero. So we've actually had companies that were offshore moved onshore, all right, with their intellectual property, their cash, their jobs. Oh, shocker, jobs. Yes, these corporations actually create jobs, right? And they moved onshore, right? That's the difference here when you talk about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Now, one other thing that I want to talk about, and we talked about the, the Congressional Budget Office, projections. Great, let's talk about them. So before, before we had the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the, the CBO said in 2024 they projected uh, that we generate about $405 billion in corporate tax revenue. Now this might shock you, but now they project after the 20, 21%, after we cut corporate tax, now the CBO projects that we will collect $569 billion because of the cut. So it begs the question, uh, uh, Mr. Winfrey, it, this begs the question, how do you think our role when we have to reduce the deficit, how does this play into economic growth uh, when we have this 21% cut and see what it's doing for inversions and seeing what it's doing for our revenue coming into the Department of Revenue? What's your, what's your thoughts? Two comments. Uh, first comment is, is that if you look at the very long run, right, if you, you study revenues over the very long run, we've had lots of different tax systems. And at no point in our history have we ever been able to grow revenue faster than GDP for more than four years, four consecutive years. At the same time, federal health care spending has been growing faster than GDP since the 1960s. That's the problem. The other problem is, is that before the pandemic, government spending as a percentage of the economy was at about 20 percent. At its peak, I mean, we had a crisis. It was about 31 percent, not, not faulting that. Now it's at about 22 percent. Every time we have a crisis, we reset that benchmark. Right. That's the problem. So, so if, if we have Democrat control uh, Congress or, or, or president next year, what's going to happen if, if it goes from 21 to 35 percent and all these other things increase? I mean, what, 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 what do you see? What's going to happen then? It will increase. I mean, th this, is, this is one of the reasons why in, in President Biden's own budget you see the deficit increasing. Absolutely. I, I want to talk about something else. So uh, I'm probably the number one or two egg district in the country. All right. So you can about imagine what taxes do. Uh, you know, we can talk about qualified business income. We've talked about that already. But I want to talk about the pilfer tax. I mean, it is. It's a pilfer tax. Think about this. You got you get you get uh, the IRS, the Department of Revenue, actually reaching in the grave with their arm, taking the dead person out of the grave and saying, hey, you owe 41 percent of your property, the property that you pay tax on all your life. Now you want to give it to your kid. Oh, you owe 41 percent. This gets cut in half, and end, I should say it ends in 2025, gets cut in half. So I want to ask you, Mr. Ramirez, what, what, how would this affect you and challenge you if you had to pass your business on to the next generation? How does this apply? Yeah, look, the death tax makes it extraordinarily difficult to pass on family-owned businesses. You know, the reality is the time I've spent with lawyers and accountants doing estate planning to put Husco in a position where it could possibly pass on to a third generation would have been much better invested creating jobs and investing in the business rather than in tax planning. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what's happening in Iowa? And this is a true story. What's happening in Iowa, so, so these families, these farmers, they can't pass it on to the next generation. All right, who are they selling it to? Our foreign adversaries, like China, foreign countries and stuff like that, because they don't, the, the children can't afford the 41%. This is absolutely ridiculous. Anyway, that's the end of my time, and I yield back, and uh, I will now uh, recognize uh, Congresswoman Mrs. Steele from California. Thank you all the witnesses, and this is a really long meeting, and thank you. And Senator Phil Graham, that you know what, I saw you so many times in California in 19, late 1980s, and it's so nice seeing you and your wife, so it's, you know, I was really happy to sit here. So I You really look good in that chair, by the way. <laughs> Someday, hopefully, but you know what, long time from now, but thank you. 
So Tax Cuts and Job Act provided tax relief to family. You know what, by the way, our take, I'll recognize myself for five minutes. The Tax Cut and Job Act provided the tax relief of families across my congressional district and provided economic growth to businesses of all sizes in California. One provision of TCJA that has had huge success for companies in California is the foreign drive intangible income deduction. FDII enhances the competitiveness of the US and combined with the competitive corporate tax rate can result in more US jobs and US-based R&D. In fact, a number of companies have brought their F offshore IP to the US or maintained in, in the US and developed their new valuable IP here at home, especially because of FDII. With the current effort at the OECD, FDII will be pivotal to protecting the U.S. against taxation by other nations. I wanted to ask Dr. Winfrey, but since he's gone, I know Senator Phil Graham, you are the expert for economy, especially for U.S. economy. So do you agree that FDII is a critical part of U.S. tax policy and maintaining and enhancing it should be a top priority for Congress? I think it's very important that America has a competitive tax system. And I think we ought to do everything we can to keep it competitive. Again, Americans don't need an advantage. We just need to have a lo level playing field. And I see he's back, so you can <laughs> ask him the question. Dr. Winfrey. I apologize. I had to, uh, my son's got a baseball game in about an hour, and I had to figure out who was going to take him there. Um, the question was about competitiveness, international competitiveness? No, it's FDII is a critical part of U.S. tax policy. It's a foreign-derived intangible income deduction. So in maintaining and enhancing, it should be a top priority for Congress. I th to, I think to, to follow up on what the Senator and Dr. Graham just said, I think that one of the things that we want to do is, is that we want to make sure that the American tax system is competitive, right? Both for, for domestic investors and then also for folks who want to invest in America. Ultimately, that is what, what, drive, what, drives, what drives growth. And so I would, so yes, I would, I would, I would agree with you. So Senator Phil Graham, that you said that competitiveness, so when this, uh, tax Cut and Job Act that it reduced corporate tax for 21%. That's a competitive rate because since it's average in the world. So we keep that number. It's better for our economy. Only a, an economy that's intent on suicide would have the highest corporate tax rate in the world. And again, I, I just want to emphasize that Everybody pays corporate taxes. A corporation is a piece of paper in a filing cabinet in Delaware. Corporations are investors, and 74% of all investments in American equities are owned by retirement funds, 401ks, IRAs, and pension funds. So this idea that there's some rich corporation out there is a fiction. It's a, and now it's a political fiction. Your, the, the corporate America is really your pension fund. And so when you're socking it to corporate America, you're taxing your pension fund. So the worker gets hit two ways. One, his wage is affected by the corporate tax because about 70% is passed on to him that can't be passed to the consumer. And secondly, the, her retirement fund is hit by the corporate tax. So the corporate tax is really a broad-based tax on poor people in America. And the tragedy is people don't know it. 
Thank you very much. My, my time is up, so Ms. Chu, you are recognized for five minutes. Um, Dr. Edwards, I also serve on the House Small Business Committee, which held a hearing just yesterday on the impact of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. One of the witnesses at this hearing, himself a small business owner, pointed out that the TCJA did not adequately address the needs of small businesses and does not invest in their success. In fact, he shared a survey of, some of small business owners that found that 80% said that TCJA did not help them hire new employees and 72% believe that the tax code favors large corporations over small businesses. In fact, this is shown in the results of the 20% 199A pass-through deduction. It's touted as a tremendous help to small businesses, but the opposite is true. It gives the largest tax breaks to the wealthiest individuals, and in fact, um, as a result in, in 2019, the latest non-pandemic year for which data was available, the average pass-through deduction across all taxpayers who claimed the deduction was roughly $7,000, but it was nearly $1 million for the 15,000 taxpayers with incomes above $10 million who claim the deduction. So it failed to invest in the smallest and youngest businesses that really needed the most support. So, Dr. Edwards, do you believe that extending the expiring Trump tax law provisions is an effective way to help the truly small businesses? Are there better ways to structure the business tax code that will help these small firms and boost productivity and wages across the board? The, the pass-through deduction has the, flaw, the exact flaws that you, that you enumerate. And, you know, what I have heard from small businesses that over the past few years what they would like is workers. That, you know, hiring is difficult, that they need more workers in the labor market. And, you know, we have had so many members talk about global competitiveness, the U.S. falling behind, wanting to level the playing field. Well, we are certainly behind in labor force participation, an area where we used to be a leader. We used to have one of the highest female labor force participation rates in the world, and we are frozen because every other industrialized country has paid family leave and subsidized child care. I, I understand that small businesses benefit from taxes in many ways. I know Mr. Hearn says I don't have qualifications to speak because I never created a single job, but I created my job, and I am a small business. And I know I don't have any employees yet, but that doesn't mean I don't have aspirations, but I can do nothing without child care. And I can do nothing if I don't have a place for my kids to go. And that is truly an era where it's not just the U.S. has fallen behind. We are in a different century than our peers and how we treat working parents. Well, let me follow up with this, Do Dr. Edwards. One of the most lopsided handouts to the wealthy included in the TCGA was this doubling of the estate tax exemption, which allows joint filers to inherit more than $27 million completely tax-free. But Republicans are not satisfied with merely extending this tax break for the ultra-rich. They want to eliminate this tax altogether. Now, in 2025, this will cost us as much as $40 billion a year. But that is the same amount of dollars that it would take to extend child care and universal preschool. So there is a cost to our society of this. Can you talk about the trade-offs of Republican plans to further weaken the estate tax? What are some of the services that the government might be able to provide if we let the Trump tax laws estate tax provisions expire? Yeah, I've proposed previously that the revenue from the estate tax could be ded dedicated to a trust fund intended for children. Um, because we have talked so much about the estate tax in terms of men like Mr. Mar Ramirez, um, but he doesn't pay it, his kids do. Uh, it's paid by inheritors of dynastic wealth. And the, the point of the proposal is that there are a lot of kids out there that don't inherit dynastic wealth and they don't inherit businesses. And this would be a way to redirect investment to them. You know, the government is not limitless as large as you are and your dollars are competing for priorities. And as much as the tax cuts can produce, you know, people who can speak to its strengths, uh, Child care, paid family leave, and more investments in children would create more workers and higher labor force participation, something that would benefit all businesses in the United States. 
Thank you. I yield back. Ms. Tinney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you to the witnesses. It's certainly a tremendous honor to have Senator Graham here. Uh, one of my very first mentors in Congress was uh, the, the former Congressman Jeb Henserling, who is a huge fan of yours and talked about you all the time. So we appreciate all your contributions. He was my student at Texas a <laughs> There you go. He talked about you a lot. He was the chairman of the committee when I was on financial services. So, uh, look, this, is, this, this issue may mean so much to me because I am a small business owner. My family business was started in 1946. We're still in existence, but barely, because we live in the state of New York. And uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was the best thing that has happened to our community in upstate New York in probably 30 years. And every business I went to, every business I communicated with in 2017, regardless of their party affiliation, what industry they were in, said this is the best thing that's happened to our business. And you want to know why? Because most of the businesses in my community are small businesses taking advantage of the pass-through deduction. Uh, the 199 deduction is so critically important. They're able to reinvest, find employees that they could give more money to and be more competitive against our biggest uh, competitor in the marketplace in upstate New York is the government. The government gives out more benefits than we could ever compete with. And so our small business was the very first one to have a 401k, the very first one to have a private health care plan. Since the advent of the Obamacare and, and uh, the Affordable Care Act in New York as well, we now have almost unaffordable insurance. Our insurance is terrible. We did have child care, and I raised my son as a single parent. I'm part of the sandwich generation. I took care of my parents, ran our family business, which was always in very rough shape in terms of the balance sheet because I was running a newspaper when the business cycle was dying on newspapers. So imagine, this was very challenging times for us. And thank goodness uh, that we have uh, benefits like, for example, uh, the estate tax. And boy, did we not have dynastic wealth. And there's no such thing as dynastic wealth in upstate New York. When you talk about my district in New York 24, the largest agricultural district in the entire Northeast, the largest dairy district, people who work uh, every day toil uh, to try to run dairy farms, to try to have crops under the impressive New York State government with taxes and fees and costs uh, and all the things that are coming to them, they are lucky if they have any value left in their land so that they can actually, and then guess what, some of them have to sell their farms and equipment just to be able to pay an estate tax. So the estate tax is a godsend to, to businesses like ours in upstate New York. And I, I just, it, it aggravates me when I hear people talk about dynastic wealth and how these, uh, these benefits are only for the wealthiest. And one thing that we don't talk about, in my district upstate New York, uh, is what I call the Rust Belt of New York. We had all the big companies were founded in my area. IBM, Corning, major companies, Kodak, Bausch & Lomb, uh, you name all these major companies all along the Erie Canal corridor where my great district is. Most of them are gone, but you know what's left? Small businesses, people who are working every day to try to make a living. And so that's why these tax cuts and jobs act were so important. 95% of the people who work in my, my area, 95% work for a small business. They don't work for an IBM, 20,000 jobs lost, all corning, all these other jobs. But one thing that was really important that never gets mentioned in the tax cuts and jobs act is the repatriation money. And that one-time reduction in the corporate tax rate that was given to a lot of businesses, and these are the big guys, they took advantage of it, paid a ton of money. It's at 1.6 trillion, I believe, so far. That I think it's ended now. But they brought hundreds of thousands of jobs from overseas to our communities. And every single day and every single year, those jobs are bringing in payroll tax, sales tax, uh, they're helping the economic output in their communities, and they're doing exactly what Mr. Irwin, Mr. Ramirez, all of you are doing. That's why the Tax Cuts and Jobs Acts are so important. Uh, and that's my, my, my uh, just, it's so important that we consider what this bill was aimed at and what it helped, and it really provided relief. And I just want one quick question, uh, and I'd love to talk to Senator Graham, but I want to talk to Mr. Irwin because you are someone who's actually running a business. And tell me about the tax pressures you face and what would happen if the on 199 deduction, uh, the pass-through deduction, were to end for you on, if the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act weren't extended? That, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, we would obviously have to let go of some employees, unfortunately. Uh, we would streamline, we'd have to pass off some of that cost to the customer. And so it would be determined on the community if we were going to stay in business in the long run. 
Now, my forecast would be if it didn't exist anymore, it's unfortunate we probably would have to close um, our doors at, at, at some point. Thank you. I appreciate that. And that is actually the truth of what's going on. This is why the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act are so important to the middle class, to middle tax tax play, taxpayers, people who are running businesses with one or two employees. I know some of my colleagues across the aisle like to focus on you know, the, the city blocks and the companies with huge numbers, but our business is driven by small business, and, that is, and this has been a godsend for us. And I honestly, I couldn't go into a single business in my community that hasn't said to me, I hope we're going to extend the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And, uh, and this is New York. This is not Texas. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, Florida. This is upstate New York where we, you know, we rely on our small business community and the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act really have saved us from some of the, uh, the harm that's been inflicted by one party rule in Albany. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm over time, but thank you so much. I appreciate it. Mr. Kustoff is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses for appearing today. Senator Graham, thank you also for appearing today. If I could with you, you've, you've talked quite a bit about the reduction in the corporate rate with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And I remember just historically when, uh, when we passed it out of the House and ultimately out of the Senate, we went to the White House for signing cer the signing ceremony of this bill, which, which was historic and, and is somebody in our position, that's a neat thing to be able to do. It's really special. I remember being on the South Lawn of the White House and hearing anecdotally about companies that were announcing bonuses and pay raises as a result of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. If I could, ju just, a, just a few. Um, right after the signing, and as, as the bill was, uh, as it was getting ready to be signed into law by President Trump, AT&T announced a $1,000 signing bonus for 200,000 of its employees. They wouldn't have done that without the Tax, Cut, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. They said that. American Airlines announced a $1,000 bonus. FedEx, which is based in my district in, in Memphis, invested $200 million in pay raises and $1.5 billion in pension benefits because of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, Bank of America at that time announced a $1,000 bonus for 145,000 of its employees. If I could, one more. First Horizon Bank, which is also based in, in Memphis, announced a $1,000 bonus for its employees. Uh, Brian Jordan, the CEO, well-respected CEO of First Horizon, issued a press release December 22nd of 2017, the day the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was, was passed. And he said, for a number of reasons, and, quote, because of recent tax reform efforts, that we believe will benefit First Horizon. We are happy to offer bonuses to our people who work hard every day to maintain First Horizon's reputation as one of the best companies to work for and one of the most trusted banks in the, in the country. So I, I've given a few examples, but Senator Graham, could you talk about how the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act allowed businesses to increase wages, to raise wages, to issue bonuses, and invest for their workers? Well, at, at the risk of sounding like a recording, I want to start by saying corporations do not pay taxes. A corporation is a piece of paper in a filing cabinet in Delaware. When Taxes go up. Let me just go through the example with it going up. A, a corporation tries to pass the cost on to its consumer, but generally it can't pass all the costs on to its consumer. And then economists have studied this in great detail for 150 years, and the findings are pretty straightforward. Between 70% and 50% of corporate taxes are paid by employees. And the other 30 to 50% are paid by the investors in the company. Now, there's this image that corporate America is, is owned by these mega rich people. 
but 74% of American stock uh, uh, investments are made by 401ks, IRAs, retirement programs, life insurance companies to back up death benefits and annuities. The huge benefit, just look at your thrift savings plan if you have one as a member of Congress. What happened to your thrift savings plan from the uh, 2017 tax cut? It exploded. And all that went to your retirement. Now, unless you're a billionaire, you benefited. Uh, it, so this is a complete misconception about how all this works. And the tragedy is that when you cut individual income taxes, you've already got half the people that don't pay income taxes. So unless you're going to just give them money, which is welfare, they don't get any benefit. When you cut corporate taxes, you affect prices. And they do benefit. And that's one of the reasons that the bottom 20% of income earners benefited so much from this tax cut. They got jobs, and costs were lower than they would have been. And these are the same people that have been being pillaged today by the fact that inflation uh, over the last three years has outrun um, wages. So it's working in reverse. So again, corporate tax cuts affect real people. Thank you, Senator Graham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I Thank you. Ms. Moore. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and let me thank the witnesses. Let me start out by acknowledging you, Mr. Ramirez, a uh, little suburb outside of Milwaukee. Uh, you're, I would love to come and visit sometimes. You sit, certainly contribute to the notion that our region has a reputation for being the machine makers of the world, and uh, we're going to reclaim that glorious uh, position. And I would say to you, Dr. Edwards, uh, a labor economist, you know, educated at the University of Wisconsin, you're well educated. And so we're really happy to have you all here. Senator Graham, you know, people do come back to the scene of the crime, don't they? <laughs> Welcome back. Um, you know, I, I guess my questions are going to start out looking at your comments and the, sort of the dialogue that has gone on here, where, for example, you uh, repeatedly said that the Tax Cut and Jobs Act benefited the lowest quintile of workers, and you've even attributed something like $5,200 um, uh, to- That was the average for the whole country. The, I, 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 I had the $5,220 was the, the average mean income went Okay, because I, I swear to God, no, I, right, no. I, I couldn't it figure that out. Because you know, when you're making twenty one thousand dollars a year, yeah. you ain't gonna get no fifty two hundred dollars out of a tax. They got gonna, nothing. And you ain't gonna forget it if you do. That, get that's it. right. You but know, I'm scratching point. my head and doing on my little calculator, and just it just wasn't working. No. But I would ask you, Doctor Edwards, isn't that increase in wages that that uh, that, doc, uh, that Mr. Graham talked about, isn't that attributable to the fact that we had at least 22 states that raised the minimum wage, cities like Seattle, the Obama recovery? I don't, you know, there's, you know, there was no direct benefit other than that 70 bucks from the Tax Cut and Job Act. Can you help clarify this for me? Uh, yes, the, you know, we're, hold on, let me start again. That was the assessment of the Congressional Research Service. That's y'all's researchers who made the assessment in 2019. This had no effect on wages. They looked at expected growth rates, unemployment, and expected economic growth and made the assessments. You know, I, I pulled it up. Uh, ordinary workers had very little growth in wage rates. Uh, outsized from what have been, would have been predicted by the economy and the unemployment rate at the time. Okay, listen. Another thing that Senator Graham said is that Workforce participation dropped from 67% to 30% in the lower quintile. 
Do you think that that's because of things like not having child care, wages were too low, no health care associated with it, no transportation? What would we attribute to a low, uh, and you know, if, if you're at the lower quintile, of course, these jobs that are available to you are those fringe jobs. What do you, what is your thought on that? Uh, well, the hero and villain of every story is baby boomers. So the top, the bottom 20% now has a much higher share of retirees okay. uh, whose income is, you know, fixed and adjusted with inflation for Social Security over time. And so that, that, that share falls. You know, I also think it, I would be remiss if I didn't say when we're talking about labor force participation, you have to talk about men and women differently. Male labor force participation, people who typically get nothing from the federal government, has been declining for 70 years. Women's labor force participation, who are the receptors of almost every public benefit that you provide because they're the caretakers of children, their labor force participation has been rising for 70. We cannot confuse the forest for the trees here. Thank you. That is excellent. So a lot of my colleagues were concerned about uh, workers um, uh, who, um, you know, about having workforce, you know, the CTC saying that you need to work to get a benefit. You know, the earned income tax credit was not changed uh, in the JCT. They, as a matter of fact, they moved to a change CPI. Um, and workers under 25 didn't get any benefit, over 65 didn't get any benefit. So even people who were working, I mean, we worked people into poverty with no changes to the earned income tax credit. True or false? I, you know, best of my knowledge, yes, but I'm, I'm actually not sure. Okay, that well, good, good, because I got more. GDP, this, these things, productivity, prosperity, the GDP, would have been 6.7% had these tax cuts paid for themselves. Instead, it was only 0.2% um, uh, uh, increase in our GDP. So not only did these tax cuts not pay for themselves, but our GDP only increased by two-tenths percent. Is that true? So mostly it's how much larger, so GDP grows pretty much every year, uh, and as do revenues, right, pretty much every year because our economy is getting better. Also spending increase pretty much every year as our economy gets bigger. The question is, what is the difference between where the economy was going mm -hmm. and then what the effects, the economic facts of the corporate or the 2017 tax law added? The Congressional Research Service concluded that the economy grew about by percent and up 0.2 percent larger than would have been otherwise an absence of the tax cuts. So 0.2 percent larger. Yeah, it's a lot of percentages and rates all at the same time. And, and it went to the top 1 percent. Mr. Chairman, I would yield back and thank you for your indulgence. Thank you, Ms. Fishbach. Thank you very much. And, and I do want to thank all of the, uh, the folks that came to testify today because you've had to sit through a lot and I think there was a couple of folks with a little too much caffeine and all kinds of stuff. So um, I appreciate you being here and sticking it out with us. Um, but I, I did know, uh, I wanted to ask Mr. Irvin, I know that uh, Congresswoman Miller was asking you a question and you ran out of time. And I'm from a rural area. And so, uh, you know, the, uh, what it does, what, how it helps rural areas and those uh, less populated areas, I would love to have you finish that answer. So, so essentially your question is like, how does the tax, the current uh, tax situation uh, help the rural areas? And help the community. Help the community. Yeah, yep. yeah. so um, just since I've been in business, my main street specifically, it's a main street in a, a small town, has increased, its biz businesses have opened up. And in particular, I'll throw out a couple of names. Um, one of my first customers on my first day of opening was Brian. And, um, you know, he was a good guy. He was a high school basketball coach. And uh, he had a dream of opening a business. And uh, a couple years after, it was right before COVID, he shared the dream with me and my wife. And we encouraged him. And not only did he, but his assistant coaches started an ice cream truck in our town. <laughs> and it was amazing. And then they ended up starting a, a, um, a tap house on my street, which kind of helped instill a nuance that we needed on our street. 
And so anyway, uh, that's one primary example um, that this, and if, he, if, if this deduction wasn't around, I highly doubt that they would have taken the risk to do what we've been able to do together. And he's joined in that entrepreneurial experience or call because of the environment that the deduction has created and continues to create. And uh, so, you know, that's one thing, but there are businesses, I've got a guy texting me right now. They are trying to open a coffee shop in Pinch, West Virginia. And he's, you know, got a million questions about it. And I'm going to be his trainer and his consultant and all of this and try to help them do what we've done. In Poco, West Virginia, another example, they're trying to revitalize that little small town, that's, that main street, they've opened a month ago. Uh, in Elkview, another place, a Clendenin, another place. And my, my list can go on and I can bore you with all of this. If that deduction goes away, this wouldn't have happened. It w- it wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do it. There wouldn't be a point because if we are being taxed at 43%, that's almost half of our business income. How can I let alone pay my bills? I would have to go back to being a low income person as my own self-employed person, you know, and, and it would be ludicrous to do that. And uh, so essentially what you know, I'm doing here is I'm not just fighting for my family and my, my street, but for all of Main Street America. Um, and for American economy, because that is what the basis is of our economy, our our small businesses. And if we're gonna put a nail in the coffin of our small businesses and entrepreneurs, and as all of you have said, big corporations started in garages, they started in kitchens, they started in the the mind of women and men and boys and girls um, who took a chance and took a risk. And some are successful, some are not. That's how, that's the American dream. And, but this deduction gives us the opportunity to pursue that dream and to realize that dream and to help others to do the same thing. And uh, so um, that's what would happen. We, if, if it doesn't exist, if this isn't extended or if it's not considered as a permanent tax for, or threshold for us, then we wouldn't be here. We won't be here. Well, and I appreciate your passion and your willingness to help others achieve that American dream. And I think what you're saying is every dollar counts because it every, does. It, your, your margins are so tight, particularly when you're starting out or you're a small business. And so I appreciate mm-hmm. you being here and taking the time. And, um, you know, I have a couple seconds left, but I'm going to yield it back because you said it all. So thank I yield you back, questions. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Carey. Uh, I want to thank the chairman. I want to thank the ranking member for uh, um, really having this hearing today, but I want to touch upon an important issue, and uh, Mr. Irwin, I, I know St. Albans well. I spent a lot of time in West Virginia over the years, and, and one of the things that I know is important to West Virginia, but it's very important to my home state of Ohio, which is historic, uh, the historic tax credit. So before I get started on my questions, uh, I do want to highlight this one issue, and I hope in the future we can have a hearing uh, to have an opportunity to discuss where perhaps provisions in the TCJA needs to be revisited. Uh, Senator Graham, great to be with you. Last time I saw you speak in uh, any one of these bodies, I was a staffer out there, and so it's, it's, a, it's an honor to, to actually be asking you a question later today. As part of this legislation, the historic tax credit was modified such that the credit actually must be spread over a five-year period of time. I cannot find any policy justification for this modification other than the revenue constraints Uh, that were required in the reconciliation process. The impact of the change to five years at the project level results in either a lower overall equity investment or a higher cost of capital. As projects must be financed, the equity investment over five years uh, receiving the entire equity investment in just one year. Increased interest rates, as we highlighted earlier, have only compounded this problem. While other challenges include competing credits, such as the green energy incentives and also the single year credits. Developers, investors, communities that work to revitalize these blighted buildings, and for those of you who don't know, I represent about 65% of the city of Columbus. So we have had some of these projects that uh, took credit for, or got some credit from this, the Atlas Building, uh, the original skyscraper in the the skyline of Columbus, Ohio, the Levesque Tower, which sits in the district, and nearly three dozen other projects across Ohio hundreds more across the nation 
are facing projects delays. In fact, they are facing cancellations. And I think, quite frankly, our communities deserve a lot better. I, along with uh, my dear friend on the other side of the aisle, Congressman Schneider, have introduced a bipartisan piece of legislation to return the historic tax credit back to the single year credit. And I ask, uh, I ask all my colleagues to support this proven tax credit uh, that has been vital for rejuvenating historic structures to help address the ongoing housing shortage and, of course, just the overall development. So my question, and Senator, it's an honor for me to actually ask you a question. I watched your career as a, as a young staffer, and uh, again, I'm really excited to ask you this question. Columbus, Ohio, where I live, is rapidly expanding. Uh, in fact, uh, the Bank of America Institute recently released a study suggesting that Columbus, in fact, was one of the fastest growing cities in the United States. Many of the corporations have been able to expand, hire new employees because of the policies that were included in TG TGCA. Do you believe that it is right that corporations simply received a huge tax cut while its true corporate rate was reduced from 35% to 21%? But didn't we also broaden the base so that, yes, these jobs created with the companies are now paying a lower rate, but on a much higher slice of that income? You've got a minute, 30 seconds, Senator. I have a bad habit of running over, but since my wife we is won't waiting for me outside, I'm going to be quick. Good deal. Um, look, any time you have the highest tax, corporate tax rate in the world, you are disadvantaging every company that operates in, in your country. And so the movement from 35 to 21 was a no-brainer. It's something we should, we should have never gotten in the position that we had the highest corporate tax rate in the world. Secondly, we, we, had this, we had this system where when companies earn money abroad, they kept it abroad. Because why would you bring it back here to be taxed? And by simply passing the 2017 tax bill and letting people bring the money back we brought as much as $3 trillion back to America to invest in Columbus, Ohio. So I think clearly, I, I don't understand how you can debate that, uh, the, the point that it made sense to cut the corporate tax rate from the highest level in the world to a level that is in the middle, right in the middle of developed nations. And then finally, You've got, you've got all these people that don't think they're paying the corporate tax rate who are. Senator, thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your indulgence, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Byer. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you all for staying so late. Um, my college statistics textbook was called Lies, Damn Lies, and Statistics, whereas my father would usually say figures lie and liars figure. We've heard, heard an awful lot of interesting statistics this afternoon, a lot of which make sense. Um, by the way, Mr. Irvin, you know, I, I've been in small business for 46 years, started more than a dozen companies, all of them still thriving, and I heartily agree with you. Getting rid of the pass-through would be devastating for the small businesses. I do think as we look towards whatever we're going to do in this year and next, that we have to be aware that much of the pass-through is not for small businesses. They're for, you know, big accounting companies and big uh, lawyer law firms and the like. And so I'm very sympathetic about what it would do to your business. and into my business 20 years ago, but, um, but we need to take a, an account of that. And with the 35% uh, tax rate, certainly the highest in the world, but let's also remember that most of the account economists said that the actual tax rate was about 13% because of all the different things that people were paying. There were some naive corporations paying 35%, but most were not. I also have to realize that most corporations were looking for 26 or 27% and were thrilled when it somehow went to 21. You know, it's also, reasonable to think that when you put more money in people's hands, some good things are going to happen to some people. However, what's really important to us is who got that benefit. In 1967, our Gini index was 39.397. Gini index, of course, being the measure of inequality, income inequality within our country. It rose to 43% in 1990, 47% in 2022, and it's looking at 52% right now. We are the highest of every industrialized country in the world. To restate, we have the most unequal incomes, the most wealth inequality 
in the industrialized world right now. And sadly, the TCGA did nothing but contribute to that. It's not that there weren't good things. There were good things that we, in the, the Jason Smith Ron Wyden bill that we passed 40 to 3 out of this committee. I'm stuck in the Senate right now. Not everything was bad, but we did need to be honest about the downsides that came from that. And Dr. Edwards, specifically, when we talk about the impact of TCGA on growth, can you talk about timing effects and the difference between cause and correlation? Thank you. Yes, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a broken record on the other side, um, where I, well, I say the, you know, happening at the same time and being caused are not the same thing. You know, most of the assessment I take for the TCGA, I take from the Congressional Research Service. I, you know, I didn't, and, and their assessment was it did not contribute to taxes. It did not contribute significantly to economic growth, and the economic growth it did contribute was well below the average projection of what it would contribute. But it did have a, happen at a time when the economy was growing and when wages were rising. But, you know, the point that I made earlier was, you know, you don't want to claim everything that's happened in corporate behavior since 2017. You don't want all that. We've had 250% increase in child labor. You don't want to claim that. That happened, I mean, that took off right as the corporate tax cut into a, went into effect. That, you would never claim that, and I would never assert that, because you know, we want to look back to, like, what we're, we want to look back to the actual causes and the actual consequences. Yes, companies paid out bonuses. According to the Congressional Research Service, they accounted for two to three percent of the total decrease in taxes that they played. They also got over a trillion dollars in corporate buyouts. 2018 was the largest year on record for corporate stock buybacks. Dr. Evers, let me interrupt you for a minute so I can give you one more chance to ask a question. You know, uh, there was a one-time, one one-year surge in corporate revenues after TCJA, but we're back down to 16 percent. And in fact, if you look um, from 2001, when it was 19.2 percent, to today, where it's averaged 17, 16 to 17 percent since TCJA, you know, my friend Jody Arrington, who chairs the Budget Committee, is passionate about the debt, as am I. How are we ever going to address the debt when our, we're spending 22 percent and corporate tax rates are 16, 17 percent, or overall tax rates? How can we do this without new revenue? You, you can't. I, I brought up earlier in my uh, original remarks, uh, if we had not had uh, four tax cuts since 2000 and maintained the revenue as a share of GDP as it was in the last years of the 20th century, you know, we would have $850 billion more in revenue each year. That's paying off Social Security in under four. Right? That's, that's, a, that's a child care program and a half in a year. Now, that's... It's about opportunities and trade-offs for where you want to spend the money and how you want to pay off your bills. Great. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Stubbe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here. I know that the hour grows late, um, but each member obviously has important questions and statements we want to make, but thank you for your time today. As this year's tax filing deadline rapidly approaches, Americans should know that the growth and benefits that they have enjoyed since the passage of Tax Cuts and Jobs Act are in peril of going away if President Biden gets his way. The difference between President Trump's tax cuts and President Biden's promised tax increases could not be clearer. President Trump's tax bill dramatically reduced tax rates for Americans at every income level. The TCJA sparked economic growth that dramatically increased the net worth of Americans, especially low-income and middle-income families. In 2018 and 2019, low-income families increased their net worth by 37% and the net worth of middle-income families skyrocketed by 40%. These low-income families experienced the lowest tax rates they have seen in 40 years. As a result of this, President Trump's historic legislation, more than 6 million people were lifted out of poverty. The TCJA also helped drive a jobs boom that still benefits the economy by slashing the corporate interest rate from 35% to 21%. A study from econo economists from the National Bureau of Economic Research in the Treasury Department found that the corporate tax reform in the TCJA helped increase domestic investment by about 20% in the two years following the law's enactment. These are not just numbers on a page. They have real meaning to real American families. This increased investment leads to jobs, which puts money in Americans' pockets and food on their dinner tables. Despite all the economic growth and prosperity unleashed by President Trump's tax cuts, it seems President Biden seeks to increase taxes on American families, which is especially concerning considering the crushing inflation that we have experienced under his administration. President Biden made no secret of his intentions during the 2020 campaign when he promised tax increases 
not cuts. He flat out said, and I quote, I'm going to get rid of the bulk of Trump's $2 trillion tax cut. The expiration of TCJA is coming soon, and President Biden's promises may come to fruition unless we act. Congress must act to make sure that the TCJA's reforms for both individual and corporate filers are, at the very least, maintained. In particular, we need to protect the 199A small business deduction because small businesses around the country will face a 43.4% federal tax rate unless we act. If we do nothing, it will have a devastating impact on small businesses and the millions of Americans who are employed by these companies. Mr. Irvin, I'll start with you. Um, as an owner of a small business that has benefited from 199A, can you please tell us how these tax provisions have real-world impact for employees and customers? Thank you for the question. Uh, so, make it easy. So, employees, you know, we're going to have to look at that in particular because, you know, obviously we won't be able to keep everyone if we're going to have that deduction gone. And uh, then we'll have to figure out uh, what, not only, when this deduction, if it's gone, we're also going to, I imagine, we would still have the continued rising costs of the rest of doing business uh, because of inflation. You know, the cost of milk, the cost of green coffee, the cost of utilities, which we haven't even brought up. And so we're going to have to analyze, you know, very soon, because that's only about 18, 20 months away, what we're going to do, what is the plan, who are we going to keep, and then it's, it's how are we going to raise prices. And in my particular part of the world, in my particular part of the country, in West Virginia, you know, our median income isn't extremely high. And most of the businesses that, that are in my state are small businesses, and they're bringing in incomes that are similar to mine. And they're employing people at the best that they can. So, Essentially, we'll have to pass off some of the costs. We have to raise our prices. Um, and then, if that doesn't work, we would have to close our doors. And that's what we're facing. Not only me, but every small business in America. You'd have to raise costs, probably, and possibly get rid of employees because of the costs incurred by the raise in the taxes. Uh, Senator Graham, I noticed in your testimony that you discuss how all Americans pay corporate taxes. Can you discuss how these hidden taxes affect everyday Americans in their investments, employment opportunities, and consumer choices? Uh, taxes affect all of them. There's no such thing as a corporation except on a piece of paper. All corporate taxes are paid by consumers, workers, and investors, and 74% of the common stock in America is owned by pension funds, 401ks, IRAs, this conception that there is this mega rich corporation out there that is not paying its fair share is bunk. Uh, because corporations do not pay taxes. Uh, and if people could understand that, uh, and if you could remove the politics from it, you could dramatically improve the economic environment in the country. Thank you all for uh, being here today, and thank you for your time. I yield back. Mr. Moore. Thank you, Chairman, for holding this important hearing. I love that we're doing you know, what I've been excited about to get on this committee, um, talking about how we can expand on the successes of the, ta of the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act leading into 2025. It's going to be a very important year. I wish every American was just focused on this one issue in, in all the politics that get presented in an election year. Um, also, to the ranking member, he offered some, some criticism on his opening statement. And while I will deny ever saying this, and only doing it when there's you know, less people here, uh, it's fair. Could the gentleman yield? Yeah. You're on camera. <laughs> <laughs> it's fair. Um, when each party gets the opportunity for budget reconciliation, we have the White House, House, and Senate, we, I, I believe we, we, we sometimes take the path of the least resistance, right? And it is for Republicans. We've proven that we wanted to get a stronger, more simplified tax code um, in tax reform. And with, in 2021, there was an enormous, you know, it was, the, it was, it was ARPA with, an, with a significant amount of spending. And so I go back home and I explain like, hey, you know, when you got two philosophies, um, we are growing our debt, right? And we, and I'm saying this internally, we need to make sure as Republicans that we're looking at the spending of our nation. And we can't just rely on just doing 
tax reform, which I support completely because I do believe it's a strong economic factor for two reasons, which I'll go into. Um, and and the and, and, and the the minority party, when they had the budget reconciliation, it was an enormous amount of spending, and um, we've got to get out of that cycle. That's why I loved what this this um, committee did this year with the tax relief bill that is currently stuck in the Senate. But it was it was one of those really productive aspects of this job that gives me every reason to get up in the morning and, and, and keep fighting for this because I, I believe that was a strong. We found waste and we were going to replace it with productive pro-growth policies both at the family level and the worker level. Um, two things that I key on from the Tax Cut and Jobs Act is real wage growth and competitiveness. Those two things are so important to me. Um, before I got elected, I went to a manufacturing facility in my district and I mean they showed me direct effects after TCJA and what they did to their frontline workers, what they did to grow wage growth across their entire community and by ambulances for their community too, to, to extent. I mean, those are the type of anecdotes that I know are getting spread across when we do, when we do significant reform like this. Um, but the one thing I would like to quickly talk about, Mr. Irvin, I'd love to, to hear from both of you and Mr. Ramirez real quick. Uh, I had the Small Business Growth Act and that's gonna lift the deduction cap up to 1.29 million if we can pass this current bill that's, that's, that's stalled in the Senate right now. Just tell me how being able to um, immediately expense certain business equipment purchases, computer, software, machinery, helps you invest in expanding your operations and workforce. Mr. Ramirez, I'll go to you real quick. You know, we're, we're too big, Congressman, for that provision to apply to us, but I'll tell you we have a lot of small manufacturers in our supply chain, and, and they are really struggling these days. So the health of our supply chain, particularly the health of our domestic supply chain, obviously. And that's actually that. what I love about this type of reform is that that will benefit them. They will also have strength, growth, and contribute more revenue. Like, and we, we see that, and we just need to continue to invest in this. Mr. Irvin. Yeah, so... I'm a, I'm a coffee business owner, and so equipment is vital to us. And so, uh, you know, upgrading our espresso machines, upgrading our grinders, um, you know, so to be able to write those off, which that, that's the question, right? How does that benefit? How does it benefit writing off the equipment costs, right? So, enable to, you know, that enables us not only to purchase the equipment, but also to train more people or take that equipment and open another location and or uh, expand and help other people, sell the equipment to somebody else to help them uh, open another location of, of their coffee business and train them on how to do it. So what, it helps us create more jobs, simply put. Helps us create more jobs, helps us uh, you know, raise wages as well, whether it's just 600 bucks to or $20,000, which is what the average cost is of an espresso machine. And the hard fought battle from this committee and from the leadership from Mr. Chairman, that, that provision is permanent. And small businesses can have that expectation going for as, as long as we can see to be able to have that, that type of write off. Um, to, to quickly wrap up, Senator Graham, we wanna make sure you get to your spouse because we know we don't wanna disrupt that. Competitive corporate tax rate worldwide, what does that mean specifically for workers and families? Well, I think the data makes your case. Uh, no matter how you want to cut this, if you look at the facts, the 2017 tax cut, along with deregulation, it's hard to separate the impact of the two, had a bigger impact on working people than any other action taken by this government in the last 50 years. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Chairman. Mr. Evans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Dr. Edwards, I'm concerned about the Trump tax bill negative impact on small business and the workers who are employed by them. Studies have shown that the majority of benefits from small business tax cut in the 2017 bill have not actually benefited real small businesses, mom and pops. Instead, these tax breaks have mostly benefited large businesses and revenue lines in the tens, hundreds of millions. Dr. Edwards, can you please explain to the committee the importance of a tax code that supports small businesses, especially for working women and workers in low income employed by these businesses? Well, this is exciting because they've actually gotten all these questions so far. So it's, um, I, I, uh, 
I think Mr. Byer said it best that there are a lot of good things in this tax bill that were poorly targeted so that there are lots of bad components. You know, we, Ms. Tenney spoke relatively passionately about farms and wanting to, you know, protect the family-run businesses, but, you know, the way that we chose to do that was by increasing the estate tax to $27 million, right? It's it, the same with the pass-through deduction. If you want to help small business, you don't need to design a deduction, you know, that two-thirds of which are going to go to the top 1%. The, the concern about the top 1% is that um, they're just very good at gaming the tax, not really them, probably their tax attorneys and their tax firm are very good at getting a complicated tax code to work in their favor. So the more that you can put bright lines so that it affects the people you want to affect, the less that it goes to the top. So I think you know small businesses have all kinds of struggles. They struggle to hire, they struggle to pay, they struggle with their taxes, but they do not benefit from a $27 million state tax exemption, and they do not benefit of two thirds of their tax cut going to the top 1%. Doctors, I strongly, a strongly supportive of child tax credit, one of the most powerful tools in decades for alleviating poverty. I do not want to, I want to thank my colleagues on the committee who helped work to get a child care tax credit on the House floor. Dr. Edwards, can you please explain for us the effect regarding the reauthorization of tax credit for the American economy at large? The year that the expanded and fully refundable child tax credit was in effect, the Census Bureau said that income reduced child poverty by 50 percent, about halved child poverty in the United States. You know, I think so much about the bill that we have been, and the law that we have debated so far today, you know, loses sight of the fact that the best way to get hardworking Americans money is to just give them the money and not to have it go through their corporation or their employer. If you want to help hardworking Americans who are having a hard time, you know, affording food, affording basic necessities, you can, you can give parents with children additional money through the tax code. It doesn't have to go through bonuses as determined by their employer. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. You back. Ms. Van Dyne. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yesterday, the Small Business Committee, of which I'm also a member, um, we, held a, we held a hearing highlighting the success of this TCJA. And the rhetoric from my colleagues across the room is completely different than what we heard from these witnesses. None of the witnesses were one percenters or wealthy corporations. But they did share a very clear message that because of the policies that were enacted under this administration, they are all paying more in taxes. My Republican colleagues and the American people knew the president was lying when he said no American making under $400,000 would not feel a tax hike. We knew it was a lie. And the hearings yesterday proved this point. And one witness added regulatory costs have gone up a whopping 460%. It's been made clear over the last three years that Biden, that President Biden, in the two years of a Democrat-controlled Congress, that Democrats are exceptionally out of touch with economic policies that benefit Americans. What we're hearing today is old and a repetitive story, which once again they retreat under their warm blanket of safe space, of tired talking points, and are scared of the reality that cutting taxes and eliminating regulations would set loose job creators and benefit family budgets. Now look, I went to college, I paid for my own way to college. It took me 10 years to pay off that debt, but because I'm the one who took it out, I'm the one who benefited, I paid it off. Do you know what got me to be able to pay it off? Having a job, having a business that was a successful that could actually hire people and invest in its employees. I also was a single mom, a mom of two. Guess what, my kids had to have childcare, I paid for it. Guess how I paid for it? I did not ask people who didn't have kids to pay for it. I didn't ask the government to pay for it. I actually was a small business owner and I was able to get clients because these clients were able to make money, invest in their employees, and hire people like me. That's how it gets paid for. But I mean, the TCJA actually grew the economy. And yet in the president's budget, he's proposed $2 trillion in new taxes. The only creative idea they have is to tax money that you have not yet received. In 2025, Congress will be facing an important choice. Continue the success of the TCJA, looking at new ways to be competitive, such as continuing the work that we've done by finding new ways for small businesses to access capital, or go back to taxing job creators at record levels. Lastly, we have an opportunity to get things right the first time with new opportunities when it comes to digital access 
assets in cryptocurrencies, and we need to take advantage of that. Senator Graham, it's great to see you again. I love, I love uh, um, your work, and I, I, you have had some great uh, comments uh, this afternoon. We often hear only the other side of the aisle that they that what the the, 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 the policies that we have, the only thing that we care about are our fiscal states when looking at tax cuts. During your time here, you were a fiscal hawk. Do you believe that the TCJA contributed to the fiscal situation that we're in now? Well, on the first of all, I can see why you won in a marginal district. Uh, look, I can say things about this bill and how it did in terms of generating revenues until 2020 when the pandemic started. And what I feel comfortable saying is that it paid for about five-eighths of itself according to the Congressional Budget Office in the 10-year projections they made prior to the pandemic. After the pandemic, you got to understand, government spent more in two years than it had ever spent in three years. And so anything that happened after that, it's almost impossible to try to attribute it to something that was set into place before it. So uh, I know this. I know that the 2017 tax cuts had a tremendous impact on ordinary people in the American economy. I know that per capita, that, that median income grew 50% faster than in any other year in the last 50 years. I know that the bottom quintile, the 20% lowest earners in the country, were the biggest beneficiaries in a percentage term. And let me say before my time runs out, my numbers on the labor force participation rate falling from 67% in 1967 to 36% today applies only to prime work age persons. Nobody can deny that these massive welfare expenditures have induced millions of people to leave the labor market. I appreciate your comments very much. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Maliotakis. Thank you very much. Appreciate uh, all the input that you've provided with us today. Um, look, I think the, uh, the success of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act is clear. I mean, this was a pro-growth, pro-jobs, uh, pro-family uh, policy. America gained seven million new jobs. Um, and the middle class family's income increased nearly $6,000, more than five times the gains during the entire Obama administration. And businesses were able to buy new equipment, they were able to invest, to expand, as our witnesses tested to today. Um, but also we saw unemployment rates, right, reach the lowest points, particularly uh, for African Americans, Hispanic Americans, um, for veterans, for women. Unemployment for women hit its lowest rate in nearly 70 years. And poverty rates decreased. Um, nearly seven million people were lifted off of food stamps. We saw uh, the middle, uh, middle class, like I said, the family uh, income increase, but we also doubled the child tax credit from 1,000 to 2,000. Well, I wasn't here, so I didn't do it, but the Congress did with President Trump. Uh, doubled the child tax credit from 1,000 to 2,000, benefiting 40 million uh, families. Um, my first question is, because I have legislation that would increase the standard deduction, so my first question is to Dr. Uh, Winfrey. Um, I believe that uh, obviously increasing the standard deduction allows people to keep more of their hard-earned money. What are your thoughts on whether we should be looking at further increasing that standard deduction, which was doubled uh, during the uh, TCGA? Thanks. That's a great question. I think that um couple things. I think that, that there are costs and benefits to increasing the standard deduction. I think that the cost to increasing the standard deduction is that you're potentially re removing people from, from paying taxes. Um, and now it is tax relief, and that's, and that's, that's a good thing, uh, typically, in, in that it, it provides people you know, more income in their pockets, increases aggregate demand, and so on and so forth. 
Um, but I would be careful about the level at which you increase the standard deduction. Now that said, one of the positive aspects of increasing the standard deduction in 2017 when we did the TCJA was that you are, we talked about brace, uh, base broadening measures before, um, by increasing the standard deduction, you're not picking winners and losers, right? And so ultimately what you're doing is you're reducing the number of itemizers. And that's a, that's a 1.7 million Americans uh, benefited from that, and I, I appreciate your comment. Senator Graham, um, in 1983, that was the last time that the Social Security taxable income threshold, it was set at, it set at 25,000 for an individual, uh, 32,000 for married couples. It has not increased in four decades. I think that's really a hardship on our senior citizens who are relying on their Social Security checks. Should we be looking at increasing that threshold that has not been increased in 40 years? Well, you got to remember that Social Security increases as real earnings increase because as you pay in more, you get more. Uh, Social Security is a tough issue because it's so difficult to deal with it. I, I dealt with it twice in my career, once in the Reagan budget and once in the bipartisan reform of Social Security. I think our primary focus today on Social Security has got to be on the fact that it has now, on a cash basis, been running a deficit for seven years. Its problem is going to get much greater. And so I would be very loath in good conscience to recommend that we raise benefits. I think we've got to come to grips with what do we want people to have and what are we willing and able to pay for. Yeah, and I think at minimum we need to eliminate the marriage penalty uh, for, for the for Well, the and also, I, I gotta come back to the point I was raised, the point was raised earlier about taxing Social Security benefits and I didn't come here to be partisan, but I, being here and hearing this debate makes me feel more partisan, I'm ashamed to say. But Bill Clinton imposed a tax on yes. Social Security benefits. I'm proud to say I voted against it. Well, that's great. Well, hopefully we can, I'm a Republican and I heard it from a Democrat, hopefully we can work together to make sure seniors can keep more of their Social Security benefit, not. That, that has, to, it's so outdated, 40 years, we really need to increase that uh, threshold. Uh, one last question for Mr. Ramirez, uh, for manufacturing, to bring uh, active pharmaceutical in ingredients, pharmaceutical in uh, manufacturing back to the United States, what tax incentives would you recommend, if any? Uh, thank you for the question. In zero seconds, you know, I, I think it got hit before, like what we need is a level playing field. We need competitive tax policy, competitive trade policy, and American manufacturers will win in that scenario and, and do it here in the United States. Mr. Schneider. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank the witnesses, A, for staying long for all of us as we get to the end, end of this hearing. Uh, and uh, so, you know, next year, one of the, things, the reason we're having this conversation, one of the things we're talking about is that next year we'll be having uh, very significant conversations about expiring aspects of the 2017 tax bill. We don't agree, Republicans and Democrats, on the uh, impact of, of that bill or the wisdom of that bill. We will agree to disagree. But I think what we can agree is that that bill has not, is not standing the test of time, which is why we're here eight years later having to have these conversations. And I think, uh, Mr. Ramirez, you, you talked about uh, a, a level playing field in trade and tax. And this is something where I think we most certainly all can agree. And, I definitely, as a Democrat, agree with you 100%. My hope next year, we won't know who will be in the chairman's seat. Chairman seat. I, as a Democrat, hope it will be Chairman Neal. Uh, but either way, if we're going to address what needs to be done in a way that will stand the test of time, we have to do it in a way that I think was very different than it was done in 2017, where we rushed it through this committee into the House where we didn't have hearings to evaluate the ideas being considered, where we didn't work in a bipartisan way. I remember saying to uh, then Chairman Brady, I want to sit down and work with you. I wasn't on the committee at that time, but I wanted to try to find a path forward that would help small businesses and make sure that they can stay competitive, that would protect the innovation that drives our economy and that has helped 
uh, the United States, made the 20th century the, the American century, we have to have a tax policy that makes sure the 21st century remains a, a, a century where American enterprise, American ingenuity, American workers can, can continue to lead. And so if, if I think about how we're going to be successful, I think we should, and Senator Graham, you were here in, in 1986, how do we do in a way that stands the test of time, has the consideration and deliberation that's necessary, and reaches across the aisle? As we think about that, uh, I'll lay out some of, of my key priorities as, as we look forward. I mentioned one, we have to ensure that the U.S. remains innovative, competitive, and competitive in this global economy. I was talking to some people earlier today. Uh, the advantages we enjoyed 75 years ago, 40 years ago, uh, 48 years ago when we talked about tax, those have been compressed today. It's a global economy where other economies are bigger than they were, their workers are better trained, their industries are, are more competitive. We have to make sure it's our stay at the end. That's why I wish we could get the Senate to move on the bipartisan bill that would re restore the R&D credit. Uh, and I'll come back to the child tax credit on that as, as, as a piece. But we also have to be at the table as we look at the OECD tax work going. We can't let it go without us. We have to invest in our kids. We can't be innovative if, if we don't invest in our children. When we in the American Rescue Plan raised the child tax credit, we found a way to cut child poverty by 50% in this country. That success can't be understated, and yet we let it slip away. We need to invest in our young kids in early education through their primary grades onto university and PhDs in science or manufacturing or whatever the case may be, because if we don't do that, we're going to fall further behind. And third, we need to make sure that we are addressing the challenges of climate change. The threats are real. We see it in the storms, the bigger tornadoes, the more powerful hurricanes. Uh, we need to make sure that we're leading, and I think in this committee we can have a, a real impact on that. So I, I want to be sensitive to time, so I, I, we've had good conversations. We'll agree to disagree on some things. I know that there are many things we agree on. We have to work together, Republicans and Democrats, if we're going to create a tax system for our country that moves our country forward, that tackles the fiscal challenges. We can't sustain, sustain a $34 trillion debt, and we have to work on bringing that down. But we can't do it if we go to our corners, if we let the show horses replace the workhorses on this committee. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to working together for the remainder of this term, and whoever is chairman next term, I look forward to making sure that this committee earns its reputation as it always has as a committee that gets things done. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Gomez. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. First, um, I'm glad once again to be back on the committee. I was off for about uh, 13 months, but it's, I'm very happy to be here, although I wasn't here in 2017 when the Trump tax cuts were, were passed. But when I heard that we were going to have a hearing on the, and the Republican majority wanted to have a hearing on the Trump tax cuts, I thought, really? You really want to do this? Because I believe that the Trump tax cuts are really one of the most egregious giveaways to the uh, most wealthy individuals in this country. And it didn't really work out very well for the Republicans in 2018. So I said, all right, let's do it. And let's go with the top five greatest hits that resulted from the, the Trump tax cuts. One, it gave 83% of the tax cut to the richest 1%. And if you want to really look at it even finer, it gave 60% of the tax cuts to the top one-tenth of 1%. 1 so think about that. Let, let that sink in, that those tax cuts were not for the working class or the majority of Americans, but really the folks at the top of the income ladder. It made the corporate tax, uh, corporate tax uh, cut permanent while leaving all the provisions of the, uh, for families and individuals temporary. Seriously? So we're going to give the corporations a permanent tax cut, and I understand some of the reasoning, but when it comes to individuals, you guys are going to just make it temporary. Right? I find that insulting. As somebody who uh, grew up with parents that never made more than $38,000 a year, you know, giving temporary tax cuts to working people but permanent I think that says a lot. It ballooned the deficit by $1.5 trillion, and the bill never paid for itself. I was brand new, so I was meeting with a lot of folks regarding the, the, this tax plan after I got elected, how it's going to impact. 
And I was always told by every expert, these tax cuts never, ever pay for themselves. Supply side never worked. I mean, how many of you have heard about the Kansas experiment, what they tried to cut taxes and taxes and taxes? It blew up the deficit to an ex uh, it, it reduced revenue so much that the own Republican legislature had to repeal those tax cuts and then had to override the Republican governor, Sam Brownback's veto. Right? Supply side doesn't work. Tax cuts never pay for themselves. But that's a story, it seems like as old as time, that people want to keep telling people. That's, how, that, that's what you, people sell. And then we have some people of this, of this committee itself that are for the Trump tax cuts, but are talking about the deficit as we speak on the floor. I find that just egregious. Five, it reduced the, the top tax rate for millionaires. And then six, disallowed deductions for union dues. For union dues, this is peanuts, right? But who does that impact? It impacts, uh, Construction workers, iron workers, plumbers, teachers, nurses, go on and on. The people that are, are, are building this country, the people that take care of our children, the people that are right now building the bridges right, and our infrastructure, the people that are going to help make sure that the Francis Scott Key Bridge is rebuilt in record time. These are the people who we just, we took that away. Why? It was not a big pay for, it was to be petty and political. So a lot of what I've seen really just tells me where we see our country, what we value. The tax code is about values, in my belief. And you can do it in a way that supports working people or not. And I think that's what the Trump tax cuts did. They did at the same time, what Democrats want to do, we want to focus on policies and tax, uh, and tax policy that helps working families, the middle class, gets us up, and people who are struggling to get in the middle class make it a little bit easier. We want affordable childcare, affordable housing, and housing that's affordable. We want to cut the child uh, uh, poverty rate like we did under the American Rescue Plan. One last thing. We have a very different idea of what the role of government should be in people's lives. But um, I was listening, and with all due respect to one of the speakers said, the greatest abuse of the Constitution of the United States in my lifetime was President Biden going to Europe and negotiating a minimum corporate income tax and giving them the power to cut to tax corporate income in America, but if you don't raise the rate. Here's the thing. The greatest, that's exactly what I, I we had to transcribe. The greatest abuse of the Constitution in my lifetime is when a former president incited a riot that tried to stop the peaceful transfer of power. That is the greatest abuse of our Constitution in the lifetime. Attacking the idea of America itself, that it is a country that is governed, self-governed by the consent of the people. That is the greatest abuse. And that's what really is this is about. I believe our values, Democrats believe in our Constitution, the working class and the middle class, and some don't. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Um, I want to thank each and every one of you for the four hours and 15 minutes that you've been part of this hearing. Um, this is the beginning of what we're going to see over the next 20 months with the expiration of $4.3 trillion worth of tax cuts on all Americans. So. We have a lot of work before us. Um, please be advised that members have two weeks to submit written questions to be answered later in writing. Those questions and your answers will be made part of the formal hearing record. With that, the committee is adjourned.